gonna start with the latest and the greatest. Number 10 is the latest Saqqara discoveries. So on January 26th of 2023, after a year long excavation of the notorious Saqqara necropolis, two ancient tombs that date back to the 5th and 6th dynasty of the Old Kingdom are unveiled to the public. Zahi Hawass, who isn't my favorite person to cite, gave a statement on one of the mummies found. Kanohe de Defe was a inspector of officials, supervisor of nobles, and a priest in the pyramid complex of Unas. Mehdi had many titles, one of them being the Keeper of Secrets, which is a title you'll hear again later in this video. This would also be a great time to take a second and subscribe to The Hive if you're a fan of discoveries such as these. Also found was a stone sarcophagus with a mummified man named Fatek, but the most important of the dusty corpses found was a gold leaf covered mummy. Hekashepis was found down a 15 meter burial shaft inside a large rectangular limestone sarcophagus. While other mummies have been found with this unusual coding choice, Hekashepis gets to take seniority. This mummy is the oldest complete mummy covered in gold, Hawass said in an interview having led the excavation himself. The excavation team also found dozens of other valuable artifacts including statues, some of which still have their original paint intact, as well as amulets, coins, earrings, rings, and tablets, all of which are currently being displayed at the Step Pyramid of Hauser in Saqqara. Number 9 is the Tomb Special of Collecting Crocs. Archaeologists excavating the Thebian necropolis in Egypt made an extraordinary but unusual discovery which was announced on December 20th of 2022. Nine crocodile heads placed inside two tombs belonging to high ranking nobles. Archaeologist Patrick Chudzik told the Newsweek that the discovery was the first of its kind as crocodile remains have never been discovered inside the tombs of Egypt despite usually being found inside of temples or special catacombs. Dr. Chudzik explains in our case things are different. Firstly, only the heads and not the entire bodies of these Nile reptiles have been have been deposited in these tombs where we work. Secondly, they were not mummified, only wrapped in linen. There is a significant difference in this as no preservatives were used. Finally, the remains were found in the tombs of humans, not catacombs of sacred animals. The tombs belonged to two top officials during the reign of the pharaoh Nehefetre, Mentohalpet II. One being the Chancellor Cheti, a high official, but the occupant of the second tomb is actually still anonymous to us. Placing of the crocodile heads in the tombs according According to Dr. Chudzik, certainly it was unusual but not entirely unprecedented. He believes that earlier researchers paid scant attention to such finds that depict cultural practices but weren't treasures, stating that it's likely similar offerings had been placed in quite a few other tombs of rich individuals, but those offerings were discarded by the earlier researchers who discovered them. Number 8 is about the Ramesid Cemetery. So in April of 2023, the joint Dutch-Italian archaeological mission of the Saqqara Archaeological Site discovered the tomb of a person called Banhishia from the Ramesid period, the chief servant of the tomb of a ten. Alongside his tomb was the discovery of four small chapels, reinforcing the previous theories that suggest the reuse of the space between the tombs of the 18th dynasty in later eras and the constructions of tombs and chapels in that area during the Ramesid period of Egypt. The cemetery is a self-contained temple, having its own entrance and inner courtyard as well as an underground burial chamber. Oddly, out of two out of those four chapels I mentioned were in dedication of a person that they don't recognize called Yo-Yo. Endless inscriptions and scenes on the walls are distinguished by their accuracy and quality of detail. One in particular shows a scene of funerary procession of Yo-Yo and the process of reviving his mummy again in the hereafter to live in the afterlife as a god, in addition to a scene depicting the cow goddess Hathor and a boat of the god Sekera, the god of the underworld. Inside the tomb, the mission found a Stella picture of Banhasi and his wife Baya, the singer of Amun, before a table of sacrifice and several drawings of priests and animals. While some have warriors, others have the terracotta inscriptions, which is number 7. The Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and, Inqui and Antiquities announced another discovery in Saqqara, March 17th, 2022. As the title of the video reveals, it's very obviously tombs, specifically 5 of them. All burials date to either Old Kingdom or the first transition slash intermediate period roughly 4,700 to 4,000 years ago. All belong to top officials and dignitaries from respective time periods and are in good state of preservation. Eity, one of the top nobles of the court, had a well-defined pathway leading to his burial room with the walls adorned with engraved pictures of many funeral scenes painted in bright terracotta and sandstone. Artistically, the colors of the paintings are considered royal colors by officials. Grave number two belonged to the wife of a man named Yart. Meanwhile, grave number three belonged to a person named Bobby Farahafe, 
who used to occupy several important court positions, namely supervisor of the great house, the chanting priest, and the cleaner of the house. The fifth cemetery is a man called Hanu, who had many titles, such as the mayor. And the sixth grave, however, is the most interesting of them, as it has the archaeologist a little giddy. A woman called Betty, who is responsible for the king's makeup, appearance, and dressing, and was buried with tons of her cosmetic tools. Allegedly, she is also a priestess of Hathor, who's the goddess of love, beauty, music, fertility, and pleasure. You want to hear something crazy? Number six is how they cracked open a tomb and found a hundred sealed coffins. It was announced on the 14th of November 2020. It's the largest find of that year. It's a hundred sealed coffins and over 40 statues alongside hundreds of mixed artifacts. Naturally, they're discovered at the Saqqara necropolis and carbon dating tells us that the items date back to the Ptolematic dynasty that ruled Egypt for some 300 years from about 320 BC to 30 BC and the late period. The coffins were found inside a burial shaft that had not been opened at all for 2,500 years. The preliminary studies revealed quickly that most of these coffins belonged to 26 dynasty priests, top officials, and elites. A number of wooden statues and colored gilded masks were also found, all in really great condition, and 28 of the statuettes are of Pates Sokar, the main god of the Saqqara necropolis. But there's one very special and unusual statue in this tomb, a bronze statue of the god Nefreta. The statue is inlaid with valuable precious stones. We're talking red agate, turquoise, jade, and lupus lazuli. It is 35 centimeters tall and has the name of its owner, Badi Amunis, engraved in its base like Andy in Toy Story. I mentioned telling y'all about another keeper of the secret, so that's exactly what number five will be. This impressive tomb complex belonged to Kedes, a priest and official who was once the most powerful in Egypt aside from the pharaoh, of course. It was found during an excavation of an unfinished pyramid that's adjacent to two extensive necropolises, but the identity of the builder or even the name of the unfinished site is still unknown. On a mission to gain that information, the Czech team were working on the site for only two weeks when they made their remarkable and unexpected discovery. The burial complex contains a tomb but also a series of other rooms, and one held a cult chapel which serves as a magnificent example of Old Kingdom architecture. In the tomb room, however, there's a limestone column Coffin and a statue of Keres, which has been somewhat miraculously preserved in its original location, according to the Czech Institute of Egyptology's report. It even still had some of its original paint. So, the statue is also a source of context in the tomb, revealing the name of Keres and his many titles for us. Based on the inscriptions from the tomb, he was also the sole friend of the pharaoh. This tomb has provided experts with many new insights on the Fifth Dynasty era. The discovery of the statue in the tomb was dramatic, as it proved an old kingdom at least. They did place statues of the dead in their own tombs. Sadly, this is one of those times where grave goods were looted centuries ago, so not much else remains. For number four, we'll learn about ancient Photoshop. Thanks to new x-ray scanning methods, as announced July 13th of 2022, we now know that some of the pharaoh's paintings have been subtly edited over time. Traditionally, the analysis of ancient Egyptian paintings has been conducted in controlled laboratory environments or museum premises. This new study has instead pioneered a groundbreaking approach. Instead of taking the painting to the lab, bring the lab to the painting. You preserve history, you aren't stealing crap you shouldn't, and nobody gets cursed for tampering. I see nothing but wins here. So the findings focused on two paintings from the Ramesseid period, which were discovered in tomb chapels located near the Theban necropolis. Through the application of x-ray technology, the team scanned specifically a painting of Ramesses II, unveiling hidden details imperceivable to the naked eye. Previously, scholars speculated the painting depicted the pharaoh grieving the loss of his father. However, the latest scan of the portrait challenges the interpretation as Ramesses can be seen beneath a cult canopy before the enthroned Ptah. Additionally, there's adjustments to the crown and other royal items in the portrait of Ramesses II, and he's currently depicted wearing a Wexit collar, which was not historically used during his reign. Underneath that new layer of paint is the original painting of a Shebu collar. These modifications likely reflect shifts in the symbolic significance of these elements over time. This finding suggests that ancient Egyptians continuously adapted their artistic expressions to convey evolving cultural and religious ideologies even when pharaohs had passed. This next tomb is a bit more recent and a bit more strange. Number three is Pet Cemetery. May 28th of 2023 marked the completion of the sixth excavation 
excavation season in the Saqqara. They had announced their latest finding, two humans and an animal embalming workshop, as well as two tombs of notable officials and their wives, all conjoined together. According to the press release from the Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities, the structures date back to the 30th Pharaonic Dynasty to the Ptolemaic period around 2400 years ago. The newest discovered animal embalming workshop was constructed with mud and limestone floors. A number of the rooms and halls were found to contain a large number of pottery, linen, animal embroidery, and different animal burials. Researchers found one room stockpiled with bronze tools used specifically for animal mummification processes and varying sizes of stone beds used to mummify the most sacred of animals. And then they found the similar room but for humans. So large stone beds ended in gutters to facilitate the mummification process with the collection of clay pots nearby to hold entrails and organs, as well as a collection of instruments and ritual vessels. Analysis later determined that the chemical residues discovered in these tombs were a mixture of fragrant or antiseptic oils, tars, and resins, according to the ministry. When all of these paints and resins are brought together, including the Damar tree resin and the Enmi oil, the researchers figured out, quite unusually, that the raw materials were imported from Asia and other regions of Africa. How did we manage to find a queen we didn't know we lost, but we're still out searching for Nefertiti and Cleopatra? Irony of life. Number two is unearthed but unknown. What are the chances that on the 100 year anniversary of unearthing King Tut's tomb, archaeologists discovered hundreds of tombs and mummies buried in Giza? This genuinely happened on November 4th of 2022, and even crazier, it's attached to a pyramid of a never before known ancient Egyptian queen. So, to quote Zahi Hawass, most burials known in the Saqqara previously were either from the Old Kingdom or Late Period. Now we have 22 interconnected shafts ranging 30 to 60 feet, all with New Kingdom burials, aka this is an unusual but incredible find. Buried within these shafts, archaeologists found huge limestone sarcophagus alongside 300 beautiful coffins, Hawass said. The coffins have individual faces, each one unique, distinguishing between men and women, and are decorated with scenes from the Book of the Dead. Each coffin also has the name of the deceased and often shows the four sons of Horus who protected the organs of the deceased. This shows that mummification reached its peak in the New Kingdom, still quoting Hawass. Some coffins have two lids and most amazing coffins so far had the mask of a woman made completely of solid gold. In addition, they found a pyramid commemorating a previously unknown queen. We have since discovered that her name was Neith and she had never before been known from historical record. It is amazing to literally rewrite what we know of history, adding a new queen to our records. While much of the life of the real Queen Neith still remains unknown, the discovery of her pyramid is likely to provide significant insight into her role. This tomb's discovery was far grander than that of Tut's, yet war overshadowed its discovery, making it back page news. Well, today it gets its rightful attention as number one. It's the Silver Pharaoh. To start some context, in ancient Egyptian culture, gold was considered the flesh of the gods, while silver was believed to be their bones. Gold was abundant in ancient Egypt, making silver more valuable as it had to be imported from Western Asia and the Mediterranean. Okay, now story time. So, amidst the chaos of the Second World War in Western Europe, a French archaeologist found the world's most fabulous tomb. At the world's worst time, as said, the discovery is largely overshadowed despite its magnitude. Somewhat understandably, as European societies preoccupied with escalating conflict. What amped the magnitude of this find was that the pharaoh was entombed in a solid silver coffin, a massive testament to immense wealth and power that we've never seen in another Egyptian tomb since. Bonus points for the silver anthropod coffin being found in a pink granite coffin, which in turn was encased within a plain granite sarcophagus. Unlike Tut's body, however, Montet only ever found a pile of bones, black dust, and funerary items like the gold mummy board and a spectacular gold mask that would have covered the pharaoh's face and given Tut a run for his mummy. Ha, <laughs> get it? This loss sadly was from groundwater seeping in through to the mummy and most of the wooden items entombed also deteriorated over time. Nonetheless, Montet was able to recover several non-perishable items such as canopic jars and shabatis, along with precious objects inside the sarcophagus, treasures that rival Tut's in their worth. When considering the wealth of the objects found in Susinna's tomb along with the duration of his reign, it appears that a reassessment of the situation in Egypt during the third intermediate period, or at least during the reign of Sunnised, the silver pharaoh, is long overdue. Number 10, Amelia Dyer. Proving one of the Victorian era's most infamous criminals, Amelia Dyer could be one of the most prolific serial killers.
killers in human history. Back in Victorian England, people were paid for adopting babies in a practice known as baby farming. Amelia Dyer turned this into her profession and adopted numerous children. She began by keeping them all for a time until they passed of natural causes, but ultimately turned to disposing them shortly after adopting them, hmm. thereby keeping the money without having to actually raise them. One of the Dyer's victims was found floating in a river, Thames, on March 30th, 1896, leading to her arrest and eventually execution. While six of the victims may have been confirmed, it's believed that Dyer may have killed up 400 individuals throughout her life. In one of the most sensational trials of the Victorian period, she was found guilty and later hung. Number 9. Richard Ramirez Also known as the Night Stalker, which is a name he prides himself like the egomaniac he is, Richard Smells Bad Ramirez was a serial killer and had violated many women by breaking into their homes. Apparently, when he was young, he had a cousin who showed him adult images and had a knack of harming women. Because of this, Richard became heavily influenced in a life of crime early on and continued to pursue said crime into adulthood. Ramirez's victims ranged in age, gender, and background, and his attacks were often pretty random, and the brutality of his crimes contributed to the sense of fear and panic within the community. He was also really into scaring people with Satanism. Ramirez was known for incorporating satanic imagery into his crime, as he left occult symbols at crime scenes and sometimes forced victims to swear allegiance to Satan. I don't know, it was his thing. Ramirez was captured in 1985 after being identified by residents in the east of Los Angeles, and he was convicted up to 13 counts of death, 5 counts of attempted killings, 11 physical violations, and 14 burglaries. The trial attracted significant widespread media attention, and Richard Ramirez died on June 7, 2013, while still on death row at San Quentin State Prison. His death was attributed to complications related to B cell lymphoma. Number 8, Eileen Wernos. Eileen Wernos was a convicted serial killer as she targeted only men as an adult worker. She had up to seven victims and would target specifically motorists, men who would meet her on the road as she acted as a hitchhiker. She was incarcerated at the Florida Department of Corrections BCI death row for women, and she tried to appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, which was later denied. At that point, she dismissed her legal counsel, terminated all pending appeals. She then would go off to say, I killed those men, I robbed them as cold as ice, and I'd do it again too. There's no chance in keeping me alive or anything because I'd kill again. I have hate crawling through my system. And she also mentioned, I am so sick of hearing this she's crazy stuff. I've been evaluated so many times. I'm competent, sane, and I'm trying to tell the truth. I'm one who seriously hates human life and I would kill again. After extreme mistreatment she suffered while imprisoned and the inhumane management given to her by her officers, in her final interview she expressed to the media, and quote, you did sabotage me, society, and the cops, and the system. An attacked woman got executed and was used for books and movies and so on. And her final on-camera words were, thanks a lot, society, for railroading my ass. She was later executed by lethal injection. Number 7. Basil Zaharoff When it comes to a good salesman, from what I've heard from friends who used to do door to door or retail, require commissions, they would always tell me about having a human connection. As for Basil Zaharoff, he was viewed as a master of bribery and corruption. Considered as the master of Europe, you're looking at the most important people of the time when it comes to influencing political scenes in Europe with his armed deals. On both sides, he would sell weapons where he'd dubbed Merchant of Death, and he didn't care which side he was selling to, just as long as he was selling. After all, considering the current times, war is a business, not even at the expenses of civilians or human life as a whole to men like Basil, they only care about money. Even today, despite his transactions, they remain a mystery as he took up two days burning as much evidence as possible. After the First World War, he wanted more money and focused on the conflicts in Greece, where he single-handedly convinced both parties between Venizelos and King Constantine to use his weapons against each other. He was basically playing Sims, but in real life. In the end, his life was shaped by seizing opportunity wherever he could find fit, and through his self-serving business dealings, he helped shape the power dynamics in Europe, and thus played an instrumental part in the history of the continent. Number 6. Ted Bundy Speaking of mommy issues, when it comes to Ted Bundy, his victims majority seem to look like his mom. Women with long dark hair, and although he had different types of victims as well, primarily had these traits. The exact number of Ted Bundy's victims are unknown, but estimate ranges from between 30 to over 100. His crimes occurred across all several states, including Washington, Oregon, Utah, and Colorado. Bundy was apprehended multiple times, but managed to escape twice in custody. His first escape occurred in Aspen's Colorado in 1977, and his second escape took place in December 1977 from a Colorado jail. During these escapees, he committed additional deaths. In 1979, Bundy was convicted of numerous charges, including these deaths, kidnappings, and burglary. He received death sentences for his crimes despite multiple appeals and efforts to delay his execution. Bundy was eventually executed in the electric chair on January 24th, 1989 at Florida State Prison. A lot of people know that it wasn't that Ted was charming. He wasn't. He was just good at manipulating people by the means of using tactics of helplessness. A down-on-his-luck sort of guy who needed help. Using this tactic, multiple times is what lured his victims who wanted to generally help him. Even now, kidnappings and abductions that still happen today use the same tactics, leaving something on your car or tagging you while you're out for groceries. So if it, by any means, if it feels like something's off, just trust your gut and 
especially if you're alone. Number five, Natalia Guerrera. Speaking of religious cults, which I'm gonna speak about it now, Natalia Guerrera was definitely part of one which she had sacrificed her two old day infant by burning him to death as part of a satanic ritual. A lot of satanisms when it comes to crime. She was also finally apprehended by police after evading capture for two years, and just after two days of giving birth, Natalia agreed to have baby Jesus killed after the leader of the Antares de la Luz cult and father of the child, Raymond Gustavo Castillo Gaete, declared the infant to be the Antichrist and that the sacrifice would help prevent the end of the world on December 21st, 2012. Natalia had previously stated in her defense that she was drugged at the time of the death, but a forensic psychologist declared the members were not under the influence when the sacrifice was carried out. After her sentence, Natalia managed to flee and was on the run for two years. Investigators noted that she had lived in different houses and even changed her identity in order to evade capture. The police also noted that after being apprehended, she did not show any remorse whatsoever and claimed that she was manipulated by the cult and was therefore innocent. Number four, Andre Chikatilio. Chikatilio was also known as the Butcher of Rostov or the Red Ripper, as a Soviet serial killer who committed series of gruesome killings and mutilations in the Soviet Union between 1978 and 1990. Chikatilio was convicted of 53 deaths, although the actual number of his victims may actually be higher. Chikatilio's killing spree began in the 1970s, targeting mostly young women and young adolescents. He lured victims to secluded areas where he would physically harm, mutilate, and then kill them. His signature was often biting and mutilating his victims' bodies. Freaking weirdo. The investigation into the series of deaths was challenging for the Soviet authorities as they faced pressure to solve the case quickly. Chikotilio managed to evade suspicion for several years and he was finally arrested in 1990 after being observed acting suspiciously near a train station in Rostov. Andrei Chikotilio was executed by firing squad on February 14th, 1994. Number three, Jane Wayne Gacy. Just like Andre, send in the clowns. Just not Jane Wayne Gacy, who had a thing for dressing up as a clown, specifically known as Pogo the Clown. Gacy had a criminal record that included convictions of physically harming and attempted assault of young boys in the 1960s. Despite these convictions, he was able to build a relatively successful contracting business and maintain a facade of normalcy. Between 1972 and 1978, Gacy physically violated and killed at least 33 teenage boys and young men, and he often lured his victims with promises of work for money, or work or money. At once at his homes, Gacy would use various methods, including strangulations or suffocations, to Kill his victims. Many of Gacy's victims were buried in a crawl space beneath his house. As the numbers of victims increased, he began disposing the bodies in the Den Plain River. The sheer scale of his crimes and the graphic nature of the evidence shocked law enforcement greatly, and Gacy went to trial in 1980 and was convicted of the 33 kills. He was sentenced to death, and during the trials, Gacy's defense unsuccessfully attempted to argue that he was just insane, but he was fully sane when he committed the crimes. Jane Wade Gacy spent 14 years on death row before he was executed by lethal injection. Number two, Jeffrey Dahmer. We gotta mention Jeffrey free as his crimes were not only disgusting and horrifying, but it for sure shook the world at how the system failed the victims he took advantage of. Jeffrey Dahmer, also known as the Milwaukee Cannibal or the Milwaukee Monster, was an American serial killer and offender who killed and dismembered 17 young men between 1978 and 1991. Dahmer's crimes included acts of necrophilia and cannibalism. As an example, one of the victims the system failed to protect from Dahmer included Conorak, a 14-year-old Laotian boy who lived near Dahmer. The night of his crime, Conorak was actually able to escape Dahmer and had two black women, Sandra Smith and Nicole Childress comfort him, but because they didn't know what to do with the situation since Conrad couldn't speak English or be able to speak in general, they had to call the police. As a result, when the police came, so did Jeffrey. Jeffrey told the police that the 14 year old was a friend of his, even though he was a grown ass adult, and had a drinking problem. But the two women were adamant and implored to the police to just check on the boy as he was bleeding out of his rear end. Instead of checking Jeffrey's ID, which could have flagged his previous charges for child harm, they instead threatened the two women for arrest. And once again, the system failed and Conrad was never seen alive again. Dahmer, with the blood of 17 men and boys, Boys on his hand had a racist imagination. More than half of his victims were black, and all but three were not white, casting Conorak as a scene of ra racialized and homoerotic violence that police are simply too unfit to notice and too in service to not be in complicit in. And finally, number one, Joseph Kony. Joseph Kony is the leader of the Lord's Resistance Army, LRA, a rebel group that originated in Uganda. The LRA is notorious for its brutal tactics, including abducting young people and forcing them to become young soldiers. Joseph Kony gained international attention due to the widespread atrocities committed by the LRA, especially against these young individuals, and efforts have been made to bring him to justice. The Lord's Resistance Army was formed in northern Uganda in the late 1980s. Joseph Kony emerged as the leader of the group, which initially claimed to fight against the Ugandan government, but later expanded its operations to neighboring countries. The LRA became known for its brutal tactics, including the abduction of these young people to serve as soldiers and, sadly, intimate slaves, if you know what I mean. The young individuals were often subjugated to physical and psychological harm, and the LRA was responsible for widespread displacement and violence in the region. In 2005, the International Criminal Court, aka the ICC, issued arrest or warrants for Joseph Kony and the other LRA leaders, charging them with crimes against humanity and war crimes in general. 
Kony remains at large, actually, and efforts to apprehend him have faced significant challenges. While the intensity of the LRA's violence has decreased over the years, Joseph Kony remains a fugitive and the group has continued to engage in sporadic violence and abduction. The situation has posed ongoing challenges for humanitarian efforts and regional stability. Joseph Kony's actions and the activities of the Lord's Resistance Army has severe and long-lasting consequences for the affected communities in Central Africa. The efforts to address the impact of the LRA to bring Kony to justice have involved combinations of regional initiatives, international corporations, and advocacy efforts. Number 10, Myra Hindley. The influence people have in wanting to be accepted by their surroundings is pretty high, especially if they are lonely or more subservient to doing whatever someone asks them to do. In the case of Myra, she's like a few on this list is part of that group. Myra Hindley was a notorious English criminal who along with her partner Ian Brady was involved in the Moore's death in 1960s. Both of their victims were young people and teenagers, and the crimes became known as the Moore's deaths because some of the victims' bodies were buried on the Saddleworth Moor near Manchester. The ages of the victims ranged from 10 to 17 years old, and Myra Henley and Ian Brady were arrested on October 1965. At their trial in 1966, they were convicted of multiple killings. Both were sentenced to life imprisonment. Henley was also convicted of harboring Brady's knowledge of John Kilbride's deaths, and Myra Henley spent over 36 years in prison. During her incarceration, she underwent various legal proceedings and appeals, and she consistently maintained that she was a reformed person and sought parole on multiple occasions. In the end, Myra died in prison on November 15, 2002, at the age of 60. Number nine, Carla Homolka. In the 1990s, a Canadian woman who gained notoriety for her involvement in a series of horrific crimes committed alongside her former husband. Homolka's first victim was her own younger sister, Tammy. Just two days before Christmas, Tammy Homolka was drugged and harmed by her older sister, Anne Bernardo, and died after choking on her own vomit. The couple then proceeded to kidnap both Leslie Mahaffey and Christian French before both were horrifically mistreated before they were killed and after Homolka was arrested. She conned the investigators and tricked them into believing that Bernardo was primarily responsible, and she testified against him and was given a very lenient sentence in return. Though the videotapes later revealed the extent of the atrocities in which he also participated in. Homolka was released from prison in 2005, and Homolka today lives in a completely different life. She settled comfortably in Quebec, where she is part of a quiet community and even volunteers at a local elementary school. Number eight, Rosemary West. Part of the serial killing couple from the Gloucestershire area of England, Rose and Fred West killed at least nine young women th together throughout the 70s and 80s. After tormenting these people, the West would then kill their victims and bury their remains in the yard and their basement. As a result, their house would later become known as the House of Horrors. Rose West also acted independently and killed her own stepdaughter through Fred. In June of 1971, West was then convicted of 10 homicides in 1995 as well as in 2022, remains in prison. Fred West then also took his own life shortly after being arrested. Number seven, Amelia Dyer. Proving one of the Victorian era's most infamous criminals, Amelia Dyer could be one of the most prolific serial killers in human history. Back in Victorian England, people were paid for adopting babies in a practice known as baby farming. Amelia Dyer would then turn this into her profession and adopted numerous young people. She began by keeping them for a time until they passed of natural causes, but ultimately turned to disposing them shortly after adopting them, thereby keeping the money without having to actually raise them. One of Dyer's victims was found floating in the River Thames on March 30th, 1896, leading to her arrest and eventually execution. While the six victims may have been confirmed, it's believed that Dyer may have actually killed up to 400 throughout her life. In one of the most sensational trials of the Victorian period, she was found guilty and later hung. Number six, Isabella I. Although they were noted as the Queen Regent of Castile and United Spain, the atrocities they had inflicted onto the world has been noted as an expansion at the hands of so many deaths. Isabella and Fernandez issued the Alhambra Decree in 1492, which resulted in the expulsions of Jews from Spain. This policy, driven by the religious and political motives, has been criticized for its impact on a significant population. She also supported the establishment of the Spanish Inquisition in 1478, while initially intending to ensure the orthodoxy of converts from Judaism and Islam. Islam, it later expanded its scope. The Inquisition was responsible for the persecution, torment, and execution of individuals accused of heresy. As well as her support for Columbus, as we know, led the discovery and eradication of the indigenous of America. Her desire and need of expansion through led to the world where it is today, left a blood trail of civilizations that were already established before they even got their colonial hands on. Number five, Dagmar Overby. Dagmar Overby was a Danish serial killer who killed, including one of her own, 
during a seven year period between 1913 to 1920. Overby was working as a professional caretaker, caring for babies born outside of marriage. Out of all the minors she killed, some were strangled, some were drowned, and the rest buried to death in her mansory heater. The exact number of Overby's victims remain unclear, but it is believed that she may have been responsible for the deaths of at least 25. In March 1921, Overby was sentenced to death in one of the most watched death trials in Danish history. The sentence was later commuted to life in jail, and Overby died in prison in 1929, age 42. Number four, Daria Saltikova. Daria Nikolaevna Saltikova, also known as the Celtic Chica, was a Russian noblewoman who gained infamy for her cruel treatment and deaths of serfs during the 18th century. She became a widow at the age of 25, and after her husband's death in 1755, Saltikova inherited significant wealth and several estates. Saltikova was known for extreme cruelty and sadistic treatment of her serfs who worked for her on her estates. She then subjected them to physical and psychological harm, including torment and death. Rumors about Saltikova's harmful behavior circulated and complaints were made to authorities. In 1768, Daria Saltikova was arrested arrested and brought to trial. The investigation revealed horrifying details of her crime, including instances of beating, mutilations, and killing of serfs. In 1768, she was sentenced to life imprisonment and perpetual penance in a convent. Daria Saltikova died in 1801 while still in confinement, and her life and crimes became the subject of legends and stories, illustrating the extreme harm that some members of the Russian nobility inflicted on their serfs. In total, she ended up killing up to 140 people. Number three, Leonardo Ciancioluli. My bad if I messed that up. Also known as the soap maker of Correggio, Leonardo was an Italian serial killer who gained infamy for her gruesome crimes in the 1930s. Leonardo's crime was motivated by a twisted belief in human sacrifice as a means of protecting her children and ensuring their well being. She believed that her killings would result in turning her victims into soap and tea cakes. And Leonardo's first known killings occurred in 1939 when she killed Faustina Setti, a middle aged woman whom she had promised to find a husband. She subsequently killed two other women, Francesca Sauvi and Virginia Cacioppo, similar using similar methods, and in 1946, Leonardo went to trial for her crimes. She was then found guilty and sentenced to 30 years in prison and three years in a criminal asylum. Leonardo spent her sentence in various prisons and psychiatric institutions where then she died on October 15th, 1970. Number two, Juana Barraza. Born in 1957 to an alcoholic mother, Juana Barraza is a former Mexican professional wrestler and one of the most prolific serial killers in Mexican history. Between 1998 and 2006, Barraza, a remarkable hefty and muscular woman, killed between 42 and 48 elderly women. This earned her the nickname the old lady killer and it was long thought that the killer was a male and it was and until January 2006 when Barraza was arrested fleeing from the home of one of her latest victims. She was found guilty on 16 charges of these crimes and sentenced to 759 years in prison. Considering all of her victims were older women, there is a chance it was due to childhood trauma from her alcoholic mother. She felt the need to take justice into her own hands and kill as many quote unquote versions of her mother she could find. But of course this is all speculation and even if that was the case, whatever her experience was with her mother was a clear indication of her subconscious motive. And finally, number one, Enriquita Marti. This Spanish woman is often referred to as a vampire owing to the nature of her crimes. It is generally believed that Marti kidnapped young people off the streets of Barcelona and put them in to work in her brothel. It is also believed that Marti killed minors and used their blood and remains in various elixirs and then she sold these elixirs to the rich claiming that they would treat dangerous ailments like tuberculosis. 12 victims have been linked to Marti although it's suspected that she killed many more. However, some historians defend Bend Marty and argue that her crimes weren't as bad or as many as the traditional story suggests. Either way, people had died. All of these women had something in common, and it was their desire and thirst for death, revenge, or just plain sadistic. Either way, I wouldn't be too sure if I'd want to be alone in a room with anyone who thinks life is something you can just take away. Number 10, Pearl Hart. Pearl Hart was a notorious figure in the American Wild West, known for involvement in a stagecoach robbery. Her life story is often intertwined with the tales of the Old West and the outlaws who sought adventure and fortune during that era. Pearl Hart, whose real name was Pearl Taylor, was born in Canada in 1871, but was later moved to the United States and became involved in various activities, including acting and singing. In 1899, Pearl Hart and a companion, Joe Boot, decided to rob a stagecoach in Arizona. The stagecoach was en route from the globe to Florence, carrying passengers and valuables. The stagecoach robbery did not go as planned, as Pearl Hart and Joe Boot were not experienced criminals, and their attempt was somewhat amateurish. They failed to obtain a significant amount of loot, and after the failed robbery, Pearl and Joe was captured by law enforcement. 
They were then later arrested and brought to trial, and Pearl Hart and Joe Boot were tried for their crimes. During the trial, Pearl presented herself as a victim of circumstances, arguing that she had committed the robbery due to personal circumstances. She was convicted and sentenced to only five years in prison. As for Joe, nobody knows. Pearl's Hart's life after her release from prison remains somewhat of a mystery. After serving about two years of her sentence, she was released due to good behavior, and Pearl Hart's belief was dramatic stint as a stagecoat robber contributed to her lasting notoriety as the annals of Wild West history. Her story became a part of a lore surrounding outlaws and characteristics of American frontier. Number nine, Laura Bullion was also known as the Rose of the Wild Bunch. She was a female outlaw associated with the Wild Bunch Gang, a notorious group of American outlaws led by Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid during the late 19th and early 20th century. Laura Bullion was born in Knickerbocker, Texas, in 1876. Her family moved to the mining town of Moab, Utah, where she grew up. Laura became acquainted with the members of the Wild Bunch, including Butch Cassidy, the Sundance Kid, and then other notorious outlaws. She developed a romantic relationship with Kid Curry, a member of the gang, and Laura Bullion participated in various criminal activities with the Wild Bunch, including train and bank robberies. She was also known for her sharp shooting skills and her involvement in the gang's illegal enterprises. In 1901, Laura was arrested in St. Louis, Missouri for her involvement in a train robbery. She was sentenced to five years in prison, but only served about three, and after her release from prison, Laura Bullion tried to lead a more law-binding life. She lived under an assumed name in Memphis, Tennessee, working as a housekeeper. Laura Bullion then passed away on December 2nd, 1961 in Memphis, Tennessee, at the age of 85, and her death was largely unnoticed by the public. Number eight, there is a limited historical information about Belle Sidions, who is also known as Madame Vestal. She was a figure associated with the American Old West during the late 19th century, particularly in the realms of entertainment and the infamous red light districts of frontier towns. Belle Sidions was reportedly an entertainer and an actress who performed in various theatrical productions and shows during the late 1800s. But later in her life, Belle Sidians adopted the alias Madame Vestals and became known for her role as Madame, managing establishments and red light districts. These areas were known for housing brothels and establishments that provided various forms of entertainment. During the late 19th century, the American West would experience rapid growth with numerous people seeking fortune and adventures in newly settled areas, as well as red light districts. The presence of the red light districts, saloons, and entertainment venues catered to the needs of this transient population that was very common. Like many individuals associated with the red light districts of the Old West, the details of Belle Sidians' life remain somewhat elusive and separating the fact that a legend can be challenging. Nevertheless, figures like Madame Vestals contribute to the colorful and diverse tapestry of the Old West societal history. Number seven, Rose Dunn, also known as the Rose of the Cameron, was a legendary figure associated with the American Old West. Born in 1878, Rose Dunn gained notoriety for her romantic entanglements with outlaws and her involvement in the activities of the Wild Bunch Gang. Hmm. Rose Dunn was also born in Indian Territory, which later became Oklahoma in 1878. She came from a large family, and her brothers were also known for their involvement in outlaw activities. Rose Dunn then became romantically involved with George Bitter Creek Newcomb, a member of the Wild Bunch Gang led by Bill Doolin. The Wild Bunch was notorious for his involvement in train and bank robberies, as we know. In 1895, a shootout occurred in the Dunn family ranch involving lawmen seeking to capture Dunn brothers and their associates. During the confrontation, Rose's brother John Dunn was killed, and her older brother George Dunn was captured after the death of Bitter Creek Newcomb. Rose Dunn then lived more of a settled life, and she married Charles Albert Noble, a farmer, and they had a family. Rose and Charles lived in Catheridge, Missouri. Rose Dunn then passed away on February 5th, 1955, in Parachute, Colorado. Number six, Sarah Jane Newman was born in Tennessee in 1817 and later moved to Texas. Also known as Sally Skull, or Sally Skull, was a figure associated with the Texas frontier during the mid 19th century. Her life story involves elements of violence, crime, and romance, contributing to her notoriety in the history of the American West. Sarah married George Washington Skull, a Texan and a participant in the Texan War of Independence. George Skull operated a ferry and owned a ranch in a location known as Skull Crossing in the San Antonio River. The crossing was an important point for travelers and cattle drives as the Skull family became involved in violent feuds with the Taylor family over land and cattle. This feud escalated and resulted in several killings on both sides. With also casualties in 1867 during the height of the feud, Scally Skull was widowed after her husband George Skull was killed. Following his death, she sought out revenge and killed several members of the Taylor family. And after the killing, Sally Skull was captured and imprisoned. She was definitely tried for the deaths, but was charged or dropped due to insufficient evidence. And after her release, Sally Skull's life became less eventful as she lived in relatively obscurity and passed away in 1888. Number five, Mary Catherine Horony, also known as Big Nose Kate, was a historical figure associated with the American Old West as she was a Hungarian born adult worker and companion to the legendary lawman and gambler Doc Holliday. Kate eventually moved to West and found herself in a rough and often lawless mining towns of the Old West as she worked as the Lady of the Night, gained notoriety for her feisty and independence personality. Kate then became romantically involved with John Henry Doc Holliday, a dentist turned gambler and gunfighter. What a career change. They met in Fort Griffin, Texas in 1870s following Doc Holliday's death in 1887. Kate Haruni then lived in various places including Arizona
Arizona and Colorado. She then worked as a nurse and a hotel owner in the early 1900s, and Kate moved to Arizona and lived in poverty. She worked in various jobs, including serving as a cook, and then in the 1930s, she applied and for received a pension for being a widow of a veteran American Indian War. Doc Holliday had happened to serve as a scout. Big Nose Kate then passed away on November 2nd, 1940, in Arizona at the age of 90. She outlived many of the famous figures of the Old West. Number four, Bell Star. Born Myra Maybell Shirley, Bell Star was a notorious figure associated with the American Wild West during the 19th century. She became known as the Bandit Queen and gained notoriety for her associations with various outlaws and her involvement in criminal activities. Bell married several times, with her famous marriage being the outlaw Cole Younger, a former member of the James Younger gang. After Younger, she then married Sam Starr, a Cherokee outlaw, which contributed to her connection with the Indian Territory, present day Oklahoma. Bell Star was also known to associate with herself with various outlaws, including Jesse James, the Younger Brothers, and the infamous Dalton Gang. Her connections to these outlaws and her involvements in horse theft and other legal activities contributed to her reputation. Bell Star and her husband Sam Star lived in the Indian Territory, where they ran a horse ranch, and their ranch became a haven for outlaws seeking refuge from the law. Bell Star was arrested several times for various offenses, including horse theft. However, she often managed to avoid lengthy imprisonments, and her criminal activities continued. Bell Star's life came to a violent end when she was shot and killed on February 3rd, 1889, while riding home from a neighbor's house. The circumstances of her death remains somewhat of a mystery, and the identity of the killer was never actually established. Bell Star's life exploits became part of the Wild West folklore, and over the years, she had been portrayed in many books, films, and television shows, contributing to her enduring legend. Number three, Etta Place. Etta Place is one of the mysteries of the American Wild West, as her true identity and details of her life pretty much remains uncertain. She was associated with the famous outlaws Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, as we also know them, and is often considered to have been romantically involved with the Sundance Kid. Despite her connections to these historical figures, she is very little known about Etta, as Etta's place, true identity, and background are unclear. Her real name and place of birth and details about her early life are not actually known at all, and some historical sources suggest that she may have been born in the United States, while others propose that she could have just been European or South American origin. At a place is also best known for her association with Butch Cassidy, uh, aka Robert Leroy Parker, and the Sundance Kid, whose actual name is Harry Alonzo Longabo, and she traveled with them during their exploits in South America, where they sought refuge to escape law enforcement in the United States. In the early 20th century, Butch Cassidy, the Sundance Kids, and Etta traveled to the South America, where they continued to life of crime, and they are believed to have engaged in bank and train robberies in countries like Argentina and Bolivia. The fate of Etta Place is uncertain, as some theories suggest that she may have perished alongside Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid in a shootout with the Bolivian authorities. However, there is actually no conclusive evidence to support this theory, as there may be other theories that Etta Place's true identity, with some speculating that she may have had used multiple names during her lifetime. However, concrete evidence to confirm her background or provide clarity on her true identity is still undiscovered. Number two, born in France around 1829, Eleanor Dumont moved from the United States and became involved with the gambling industry known as the Gold Rush. She arrived in California during the Gold Rush of 1850, seeking opportunities in the Burgeon mining towns in 1854. Eleanor ended up opening a gambling establishment in Nevada City, California, where she ran gambling tables and her reputation for her skills as a car dealer. She then became known as Madame Moustache due to the fact that she had distinctive facial hair and refused to remove it despite societal expectations. And over the years, Madame Moustache opened and managed several gambling establishments in various mining towns, including Virginia City and Bodie. Despite her success in the gambling business, Eleanor faced financial challenges and struggled to maintain her enterprises. She suffered major losses and debts that ended up leading to her to a decline in her fortunes. And then Eleanor Dumont's life took a tragic turn, and as in 1879, facing financial difficulties and heartbreak, she took her own life by ingesting an overdose of really intense drugs in Bodie, California. Eleanor Dumont's story proves that a glimpse into the complexities of life during the gold rush and the challenges faced by women trying to make a living in a male-dominated society. Her role as a successful gambler and car dealer, as well as her refusal to conform to traditional gender norms, contributed to her place in the history of the American West. The nickname Madame Moustache and her distinctive facial features further add the colorful and unconventional aspects of her life. And finally, number one, Bonnie Parker was one half of the notorious criminal duo known as Bonnie and Clyde. Alongside Clyde Barrow, Bonnie Parker gained notoriety during the Great Depression for a series of bank robberies and criminal activities in the early 1930s. Bonnie Elizabeth Parker was born on October 1st, 1910 in Rowena, Texas, and she grew up in a working class family and despite her small stature, developed a love for poetry and drama. Mm, I wonder if that's what caused her to join Clyde. Because she joined Clyde Barrow in January 1930. Clyde was already a seasoned criminal. A little bit of spice, a little paprika, was serving time in East End Prison Farm in Texas. A mutual acquaintance smuggled a weapon to Clyde and he used it to escape. Bonnie and Clyde embarked on a crime spree that included bank robberies, burglaries, and car thefts. They were involved in several pew pew outs with law enforcement, and their criminal exploits attracted significant media attention. Bonnie and Clyde were often a part of criminal gang that included their other associates, such as the Clyde brothers, Buck Barrow, and his wife, Blanche Barrow. The gang engaged in violent confrontations with law enforcement, resulting in injuries and fatalities on both sides. Bonnie and Clyde gained a 
additional notoriety due to photographs found by police at one of their hideouts, and the images depicted the couple posing with weapons, contributing to their image of glamorous and dangerous criminals. Bonnie and Clyde crime spree came to a violent end on May 23, 1934, when the law enforcement officers ambushed their car near Benville Parish, Louisiana. The officers fired a barrage of bullets, killing both Bonnie and Clyde instantly, and the story of Bonnie and Clyde has become a part of American folklore. Their criminal exploits and romanticized in the media have been a subject of numerous books, films, and songs, and the 1967 film Bonnie and Clyde starring Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway further cemented their status as infamous figures. Number 10, Ted Kaczynski. As a young man, Kaczynski was a mathematic prodigy, and at Harvard University, he underwent psychological experimentation designed to harm and humiliate subjects, which may have been part of the CIA's mind control program, aka MK Ultra, as he began to have a promising career at UC Berkeley, then suddenly resigned and retreated to the wilderness, determined to fight industrialization and the destruction of nature. Between 1978 and 1995, he mailed and delivered explosives to targets of tertiary institutions and aviation companies across the country, killing at least three people and injuring 23. The FBI dubbed him the University and Airline Bomber, leading to the nickname the Unabomber. A manhunt finally caught Kaczynski in 1996, after which he was given eight life sentences. Number nine, Henry Kissinger. Considering he was a very notable figure in American politics, his choices in regards to political American policies involving foreign affairs were extremely costly and disregarding of human life. When the Vietnam War exploded in 1955 and lasted till 1975, it had been noted that it was America's longest and most expensive war that had occurred in that era. At this time, there had been at least four noted US presidents, and Henry Kissinger acted as a Secretary of State for both Nixon and Ford. In regards to the conflicts between the North and the South Vietnam over the control of which mega empire would rule, this side more in Asia, whether the USSR in the North, Americans in the South, that backing that could have technically liberated the South Vietnamese was costly, as it was noted to be up to another potential $700 million. But Kissinger, despite him stating in reports he wished Congress approved his call to liberate the South Vietnamese, he happened to also make deals behind closed doors with their leaders, sacrificing them for the US POWs held hostage in the North. But also considering it was expensive and they needed oil, the Middle East were having conflicts after the Nakba that occurred in Palestine, how the colony Israel had taken over lands, and in order for the US to get oil, Kissinger had to write to Israel to release some of the lands so they could, that they colonized back to the Arab nations so that the US could get oil to continue their war in Vietnam. But the sympathy towards the South Vietnamese dwindled not just economically but socially. When people went into the streets yelling for the government to stop funding this war, killing civilians not just the American young men forced into the war and developing PTSD later, but the hundreds of thousands of innocent Vietnamese that had also died. Kissinger had the gall to also say to President Ford in a quote, if you do that, the American people will go in the streets again, and referring to the Vietnamese, why don't those people die faster? The worst thing they can do is linger on. Yeah, he said that. As a result, the $700 million that could have liberated the South Vietnamese mysteriously was rejected by 76 congressmen into the Senate and went towards the colony Israel instead. As well as in regards to the Bangladesh Liberation War, Kissinger sneered at the people who bled for the dying Bengalis and even called Indians bastards. Mm, nice guy. Number 8, Harvey Weinstein. For sure, this guy is pretty new for the history books, but he will for sure be mentioned in law books in regarding to blackmailing, coercion, and so much more messed up stuff like physically harming, harassing women, and threatening their career. As a former Hollywood film producer, he became the center of a high profile criminal case that brought attention to issues of harassment and physical harm in the entertainment industry. The allegations against Weinstein were a catalyst for the Me Too movement, a social media campaign encouraging survivors of harassment and harm to come forward with their experiences. The movement shed light on the widespread issues of misconduct in various industries. Weinstein faced a high profile trial in New York in early 2020, and the trial included testimony from multiple women who accused him of misconduct. On February 24, 2020, Weinstein was then convicted of physical non consensual harm in the third degree and criminal act in the first degree. He was then acquitted for more serious charges, including predatory harm. Number seven, Ed Gein. Ed Gein, also known as the Butcher of Plainfield or the Plainfield Gowl, was an American killer and body snatcher who gained infamy for his gruesome crimes in the 1950s. His activities served as a partial inspiration for various fictional serial killers in books and films. Gein's crime was discovered in 1957 when police investigated the disappearance of a hardware store owner, Bernice Warden. During a search of Gein's property, they found Warden's decapitated body hanging in Gein's shed, dressed out like a deer. Dressed, like skinned. Further investigation revealed a house of horrors as Gein was a grave robber who exhumed corpses from local cemeteries. He admitted to creating a variety of items from human body parts, including clothing, furniture, and masks. Gein's gruesome artifacts shocked the public so much and 
fueled sensationalized media coverage and Gein was suspected in the disappearances of two other individuals, but only two deaths were definitely linked to him, Bernice Warden, and his own brother, Henry Gein. Ed Gein was declared mentally unfit for trial and spent the rest of his life in psychiatric institutions. He was then diagnosed with schizophrenia and his confinement included time in the Central State Hospital for the criminally insane in Wapon, Wisconsin, later in a mental health institution. He was kind of inspired for that chainsaw massacre thing as well. Number 6 Clementine Barnabet Clementine Barnabet was an American woman who gained notoriety in the early 20th century for alleged involvement in a series of death in Louisiana. Barnabet claimed to be a member of a religious cult led by her father, Raymond Barnabet, and she asserted that the cult believed in cleansing the world by killing those that seemed sinful. Between 1911 and 1912, a series of brutal axe deaths occurred in Texas and Louisiana, and Barnabet confessed to being involved in some of these killings. In 1912, Clementine was arrested along with her father, two brothers, and the connections of these deaths. She confessed to her involvement in the crimes, claiming that she and her family were carrying out God's works, killing sinners. It was a job. Bernabette's confession came under scrutiny as some believed it might have been coerced or influenced by her father, but uh, there were also doubts about the accuracy of her statements. And uh, regarding the number of victims and her role in the killings, Clementine Bernabette then went to trial for her alleged. Um, involvement in the crime. In 1913, she was found guilty and sentenced to prison, and her father and brothers were also convicted, but more of a lengthy sentence. Clementine Barnabet spent the rest of her life in prison and was never released, thankfully. And the circumstance surrounding the crime and remains a controversial and still unsolved or unresolved. Number 5. Jeffrey Epstein I know a lot of folks know this man is a greedy, nasty, rich jerk who lived in a vile organization, allowing other rich, nasty folk to take advantage of the young and vulnerable. But as the ringleader of a trafficking and harming of young women everywhere, apparently in 2008, Epstein pleaded guilty to state charges in Florida for soliciting and procuring a person under 18 for adult work, meaning under 18, young adolescents, like the age of 12 or 14. He then reached a plea deal that allowed him to avoid federal charges and served only 13 months in jail. This lenient deal orchestrated by the then US attorney Alexander Acosta later then became a subject of public scrutiny. Which as it should, considering why is the US so lenient on crimes on young people, like people that the law should protect. And then finally, 10 years later, after who knows how much more damage and crime he's committed, in July 2019, federal prosecutors in New York arrested Epstein on trafficking charges. They accused him of exploiting and abusing dozens of underage girls, and the arrest following the unsealing of a new indictment, but by then 2020, somehow he died in his cell. Some say he took his own life, and others, well, when it comes to controversy, that they didn't want him to talk. After all, the nature of his relationships and the extent of his activities fueled public outrage. He wasn't alone in this, after all, he needed someone else to lure these young underage individuals. So, just Elaine Maxwell, you know her, was also charged and arrested. Investigations into Epstein's activities and the circumstances surrounding the 2008 plea deal continued. Legal actions against his estate and those connected to him remain ongoing, reflecting the broader effort to seek justice for their victims. Number 4. Joseph James Delangelo Joseph James Delangelo, also known as the Golden State Killer, is an American serial killer and caused this YouTube, because I gotta be very discreet, physically violated people, if you know what I mean, who terrorized, Cal uh, who terrorized California in the 1970s and 1980s. Delangelo's crime was initially attributed to several monks Cures, including East Area Harmer and original Night Stalker, unlike Richard Ramirez, another serial killer and vile man. His crime initially began in the Sacramento area before spreading out to other parts of the state. D'Angelo modus operandi included breaking into homes, often targeting couples. I guess he was just jealous. He would tie up and harm the victims, committing non consensual harm and then theft. In later crimes, he escalated to killings, earning him the nickname the Golden State Killer. The, the case remained unsolved for decades, but advancement in DNA technology played a crucial role in solving it. In 2018, investigators used a public gene genealogy website to identify distant relatives of the suspect and eventually led them to Joseph James D'Angelo. D'Angelo was arrested on April 24, 2018 at his home in Citrus Heights, California, and he was identified through DNA evidence and genealogical research. At the time of his arrest, D'Angelo was also, get this, a former police officer, which added to an extra layer of shock to the case. In August 2020, D'Angelo was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, and the sentence marking the conclusion of one of the most notorious unsolved criminal cases in US history. Number 3. Nathan Bedford Forrest. What a name. There's so many interesting names on this list. Nathan Bedford Forrest was a prominent Confederate general during the American Civil War. Unsurprisingly, given his culpability in the Ford Pillow Massacre in April 1864 and the formation of the Triple Ks, Forrest and his image may have come under attack by many sectors, especially from African Americans. The Triple Ks embarked upon a campaign of intimidation and violence against Southern blacks and Republicans until Forrest ordered the organization to disbanded in 1869. Nevertheless, the local chapters of the Triple Ks continued to be active and Forrest was ordered to appear before congressional hearing in 1871, and his sometimes contradictory testimony, he denied he ever had membership in this organization. Yeah, you're. He's the one who had the receipt. A combination of age, exhaustion, and conversation to Christianity may have caused the forest's fiery temper and racial attitudes to his moderate and later years. 
Number two, Samuel Little. Apparently noted the most discreet but also most vile crime committing killers. The reason why he was able to get away with over killing 93 women was because of the time or the height of these deaths. Majority, if not all of these women, were women of color who worked as adult workers. And because in the 70s, law enforcement didn't prioritize people of color or the occupation of working as an adult worker, any case of missing persons from both of these factions as a cohesive was met with dismissal. So Samuel, who had a blood thirst for control and death, committed to these crimes only to these main demographics and even admitted that once he was caught at a homeless shelter in Kentucky. Originally, the arrest was over narcotics, but while they tested DNA, they found the link to his crimes that were left as cold cases. And he actually memorized all of the victims that he had killed. That was crazy. Number one, Raymond Volden Lahir and John Heller. These men are hella messed up, and I'm not surprised, but it's also known that, um, yeah, that's pretty much why these guys are on this list. Specifically, Raymond, he was a doctor who, who ran a research study to learn about the effects of syphilis on 400 African American men, also supposedly also 600 African men around that range. The study began in 1932, and in the 1940s, the cure of syphilis was discovered in penicillin. As a result, during the experimentation, the doctors didn't tell the patients they had syphilis and didn't even give them a cure. Even some of the subjects who have heard about penicillin, so the doctors gave them sugar pills and said that they were cured when they weren't. They even prevented 50s era public health campaigns to cure syphilis from an operating in their area, and they told patients that the painful spinal taps and other procedures were free treatments. They did not allow patients to see any other doctors just in case those other doctors would cure them and mess up their so-called research. Many of the patients were drafted for World War II, and the military wanted to cure their syphilis and recruit them, which the researchers fought as best as they were able to, and the study finally ended in 1972. By that time, 128 of the men have died from syphilis, and the rest have been treated by military while they were drafted. Many of the children were born with syphilis-related birth defects and more than that born dead. The last victim of this gross and horrible experiment, also known as the infamous Tuskegee syphilis study, was Ernest Hendon, who died on the 16th of January 2004. According to Fred Gray, a lawyer who represented victims of the study of the federal lawsuit, eventually in the courts as well as the study of the law of the case brought to wild attention of the three that were unethical of the study. Evidently, the rights of the research subjects were violated. The Tuskegee study raised a lot of host of ethical issues such as informed consent, racism, patronism, unfair subject selection in research, maleficence, truth-telling, and and justice, among others. The gross part that even though the research helped reduce syphilis, John got an award for it despite the traumatizing things that he had done to the patients for life. Number 10, Hathor. The goddess Hathor was originally created by her dad, Ra, as a destroyer of men. She was supposed to punish all those who were disobedient to him. But then Ra was like, meh. I don't really like that idea, he just kind of changed his mind and decided to make her the exact opposite, instead the goddess of love. But she kind of loved killing men and like even he couldn't stop her. So one night he gave her what was supposed to be a mug of ale, but actually made it like a special kind of blood and she got so drunk off of it that she got too tired out to kill anymore and therefore became the goddess of love. <laughs> Drunk in love, am I right? Her cult was centered in Dendera, where she was also seen as the goddess of fertility and childbirth. When the Greeks occupied Egypt, they compared her with the goddess Aphrodite. But unlike the voluptuous woman Aphrodite was depicted as, Hathor came in three forms, and I bet you can't guess which. She was depicted as either a woman with a cow's ears, wearing the headdress of a cow, or just a cow. Moo. <laughs> Number nine, the beginning of the world. I yeah, what a what an inventive way to imagine the beginning of things. I mean, the Big Bang is still pretty crazy too. But hey, here we go. Freaking love how much magic is in these stories. Like I'm in because that's all there was at the beginning of the universe, according to the ancient Egyptians. Just swirling darkness, chaos, and magic. Heka, the god of magic, was the only thing that existed, waiting for the opportune moment to begin. Then a hill showed up called Ben Ben, and out of which the god Atum erupted from. He was lonely, so he mated with his own shadow to give birth to two children, Shu and Tefnut. Shu gave life, Tefnut gave order. They left their their father to build the world, but they were gone so long he took out his eye and sent it to search for them. In the meantime, he just kind of sat there contemplating eternity all alone. It was really sad. This guy sounds like Zeus mixed with Eeyore. Anyways, his kids came back and he was so happy he wept tears of joy and out of which were born men and women. They also brought his eye back, so that was nice. 
Number eight, light as a feather. So unlike a lot of religions we've heard of, there wasn't really a concept of hell in Egyptian mythology. It was either you were worthy of heading into the afterlife or you weren't. Maat was the goddess of harmony and supported the belief that if harmony was disrupted, it must be restored. Every ancient Egyptian myth in some form follows this format. But the most important role she played was in the afterlife. When the soul left the body, it would appear in the hall of truth in order to stand judgement before Osiris. The heart would be weighed on a golden scale against Mott's white feather. If the heart was heavier, it would be devoured by a monster and the soul would disappear. If it was lighter, then you could go live in eternal bliss. So instead of several layers of burning torment, souls in Egypt instead faced eternal darkness and unconsciousness. The idea of non-existence was more terrifying than being cut up by demons. Huh. Number seven, Osiris and Isis. Okay, so we aren't strangers to deities being a fan of incest. It was kind of like how they multiplied and ancient Greeks were okay with it kind of but they kind of weren't. Anyways, the Egyptian gods were no exception. Isis and Osiris were two of the four children of the goddess of Nut. Isis and Osiris were married and actually really in love. They, they, they dug each other. When Osiris rose to the throne as the eldest sibling, his brother Set was pretty jealous. So he took the life of his own brother, cut him into little pieces and scattered them all over Egypt. He really wanted to make sure the guy was dead. But then Isis wasn't someone you wanted to mess with. She had great magical powers capable of restoring life. She collected all of the pieces of her brother slash husband and breathed life back into him. Osiris returned to life and they made all the love and then soon conceived a child named Horus. However, Osiris couldn't return to the land of the living, so he had to stay and rule over the underworld. So his son Horus was left to get revenge and we'll get to that later. Number six, Anubis. Now I think in West Western films that depict ancient Egypt, like The Mummy Returns, the god Anubis is often associated with the underworld. You know, that creepy half man, half jackal creature who appears to walk out of your nightmares? He's so creepy. Well, he did used to run the underworld until Osiris took over, but he was actually the god of mummification and the afterlife. So not wrong, but not the whole story. Anubis was the son of Nephthys and Set. Well. Kind of. Nephthys actually never conceived the child with Set. She kind of had a she kind of had the hots for Osiris. So she disguised herself as Isis and made love to him that way, and then Anubis came to life. That may have been one of the reasons Seth attacked Osiris in the first place as his suspicions rose. But it was actually Anubis who helped Isis piece together Osiris, creating the first mummy. Fun fact, during the Greek rule of Egypt, Anubis and Hermes were seen kind of as the same. The people who ferried the dead to the underworld. Oh sorry, and a point. Anubis was actually the one who weighed people's hearts, so he used the feather. The thing, you know what to do. He was responsible for doing that. Number five, Horus and Set. Speaking of Horus, earlier, remember how I said Horus had to take over defending his father? Well, here is where this story begins. When Horus grew up to be a man, he pulled a Hamlet. He was like, You killed my father, prepare to die. Thus, a series of battles ensued, and one of the gods didn't play fair. Set kept cheating at everything and continued to come out as victor. Not surprising since he didn't earn his way on the throne, he killed for it, kind of like a certain Claudius. Eventually Isis stepped up to help her son slash nephew overcome her brother. She set a trap for Set, but after some pitiless begging for his own life, she let him go. Horus was pissed, so angry some of the other gods got upset that he was so angry. They agreed to compete in a final boat race and Horus was like crushing it. He was doing really well, he was about to win. But then of course, Set cheated by turning into a hippopotamus and attacked the boat. Therefore claiming victory once again. Osiris finally showed up and declared that no man should take the throne through murder. So Horus took the throne. Why Osiris didn't just settle the whole deal from the beginning is confusing in itself, but hey, kind of reminded me of the eagles that showed at the end of Lord of the Rings that could have saved like three movies, you know? Kind of like that. Anyways, let's move on. Number four, Ra and his boat. Ra is one of the most revered gods in Egyptian mythology, especially since he was the god of the sun. He was depicted as a man with the head of a falcon. That kind of makes sense. He was once the greatest of all gods, but had to take a step back after he got too old and tired, and especially considering his task, I can see why. His job was to drive away darkness and sail across the skies, delivering light wherever he went. But at night, he would dive into the underworld and have to cross 12 gates. 12 hours, an hour per gate. After paying his respect to Osiris, every night, a giant snake named Apophis tried to attack and swallow the boat. Every night! 
Poor guy. No wonder he got worn out. Every day it got harder to defend, and even one night, Apophis succeeded, but could only hold the sunlight for so long. She threw it up, which explained solar eclipses. After Set was cast out after the whole nephew battle, he ended up serving Ra in his boat and kept the snake at bay. But there's something confusing coming later that I think you'll agree is very confusing. So here we go. Coming up next, we have Bass, number three. Have you ever had a cat look you up and down and kind of like expect something? Like worship? You know? Are you a cat person? Dog person? Let me know in the comments. Well, that's because cats were a big deal in Egyptian mythology. They even had their own goddess. Bastet was a cat goddess depicted as a woman with a cat's head. Cats had a meaningful role in ancient Egypt as they protected their food from rats and snakes. They were even seen as family members and to harm one was punishable by death. Legend says that sometimes cats would enter burning buildings to save their families. If they died, the goddess would bring them back to life, hence the idea of cats having nine lives. There it is. Now here's where things get confusing. You know that story I told about Ra? Well apparently Bastet was in the boat with him as well. During the day she would ride with him, and at night she would turn into a cat and then defend the boat from Apophis the snake. But I thought that was set. So many conflicting things. I saw like a couple different stories who said, each thing was different, so who knows. Number two, Jeb and Nut. Yet another sibling partnership, we have Jeb and Nut. They fell deeply in love and could never be separated. They were that couple who would like constantly be like, oh my god, stop, right next to each other at dinner, you know what I mean? Jeb was the god of the earth and Nut was the god of the sky. A previously mentioned god, Atum, found their union inappropriate, so he pushed Nut into the sky far away from Jeb. He just didn't like being a third wheel. Jeb and Nut were close enough to see each other, but can never hold each other again. And she gave birth to Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys. Some say Horus too, but I don't think that's true. Number one, the treasure thief. Okay, I don't know how I feel about this story, okay? This doesn't really feel like harmony is in balance, but anyways. The treasure thief ends in a way I really didn't expect and I'm not sure you will either. Long ago, a great pharaoh with a wealth of riches decided to build a pyramid in which to keep them safe. One of the builders was wise to his plan and decided to find a way to claim them for himself. He built a stone vault with a hidden entrance covered by a slab so he could get to the riches. But unfortunately, he fell ill before he could return, so he told his sons of his plan. The sons headed to the pyramid in the dead of night, following the their father's order, but unbeknownst to them, the pharaoh had laid booby traps and one brother was caught in one. Not wanting to be found or interrogated, revealing his other brother, he told his brother to chop his head off. Ugh, that he did. Loyalty? I don't know. The pharaoh upon finding the body hung it up in the town square in the hopes of like weeding out whoever it belonged to. But the other brother being so clever got the guards drunk and stole back his brother's body in the dead of night. The pharaoh was like, I'm not even mad. I'm just impressed. He gave the thief a pardon, summoned him to the square and gave his daughter to marry him. Yeah, dude, you tried to steal my jewels? Don't worry about it. Have my daughter, because you're so talented at your job. Great work. Kicking off the list at number 10, KB55. Located in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, Tomb 55, otherwise known as KB55, was found by Edward Arden back in 1907. It was discovered right next to King Tut's tomb, and the reason we call this tomb by a number rather than name is because we really don't know who was inside it yet. Even the walls outside of the tomb, they aren't covered with any hieroglyphs to tip us off or give us any hints. It's just bare which is kind of eerie. As you walk down the 20 steps towards KV55, you'll notice markings on the entrance. Markings that show that the entrance was widened since it was first cut, along with its ceilings being raised higher. So whatever was in there needed the room. The only hint as to who was buried remains on the walls. One hieroglyph remains and it was discovered in 1907 and it translates to the evil one that shall not live again. Even these massive stones were built in order to prevent anything from getting out. See, usually with these ancient tombs, it's the opposite. The description for who's inside the tomb had also been destroyed. So we have no idea who or what is in KB55. Number nine, King Teti. The Pyramid of Teti was built for the first ruler of the sixth dynasty, and while it's not flashy or massive as these other pyramids, the insides contain the oldest writing in the religious world. Pretty insane. Now these texts go back to 2400 BC, way back when we used, you know, BBM. The pyramid texts were specifically written so that this King Teti could ascend to the heavens after his death. 
There are spells and incantations meant to free the king's soul and arrive in the cosmos. More specifically, for Teti to become a star in the sky and then join Osiris and Orion in the God Squad. There's even instructions on how to preserve the body and travel to said heavens. World's oldest instruction manual for the win. Number eight, Queen Nefertiti. After a scan was done on King Tut's tomb, there were cracks found on the north and earth walls. East, Taylor, east, not earth. There were cracks found on the north and east side walls. So we believe that this is a secret passageway to Queen Nefertiti, the ruler during the 14th century BC, and also wife to King Tut. Queen Nefertiti's parents are also still unknown to this day, so that adds to it. And with ancient texts depicting that these kings and queens would leave Earth and then later return, perhaps they are both descendants of extraterrestrials. And this flying sun disk that they worshipped was not the sun, but rather a winged alien ancestor. Number seven, Dozer. For this one, we're looking into some bull worshipping, so grab your red scarves and start waving them around. Just north of the step pyramid of the Pharaoh Doser, archaeologist August Marionette discovered this site in 1851. The Serapium is a temple dedicated to the Egyptian deity Serapis, a combination of Osiris and Apis in human form. Now, this was a large burial ground for the Apis bulls. They were basically these bulls that were said to be sacred, and after their death, they would become immortal. Remember that, that's important. Today at Saqqara, there's this massive vault. It's 382 yards long, and it's carved out of sandstone bedrock. It's massive, and along the sides of them are 24 chambers, each with sarcophagus carved out of a single chunk of granite. Now, inside these boxes were animal remains, just bones and all. But back then, in those times, you weren't allowed to break up any bodies. That was a no-go. You had to mummify them. So how were these tombs built, first of all, so perfectly, weighing over 80 tons, and where do these bones come from? Perhaps these are the remains of the Apis bull. After all, that's the inspiration for the Minotaurs, so maybe alien ancestors looked a lot more jacked than we may think. Number six, dung beetles. This one isn't exactly a pharaoh at all, but it's too good to leave out, especially if we're talking about aliens here. It's important. Dung beetles, also known as scarabs, are the only species in the entire world that follows the Milky Way. Think about that for a second. That is... Let's talk about it. Some animals follow the sun. You know, turtles sprint to the ocean the second they're born to avoid getting plucked up by birds. Now these insects would follow the line of the Milky Way and then roll their towards it. Literally, their, their poop, they would roll it towards the skies, which is insane. Symbols of these beetles are seen all over, either in hieroglyphics or even in movies, their presence is known. Near the sacred lake at the Temple of Karnak, there is a massive scarab monument. And there's even a legend still to this day behind said statue that if you walk around it nine times, you would find health, wealth, and love. And you'd also probably be a little bit dizzy. The scarab is there to represent the god Kefri, which at the time Egyptians believed was the sun as well. Also known as the scarab face god, which terrifying when you imagine that. Are these bugs just trying to get home into space to their bug alien master? Why does he need so much poop? Whatever DIY project they're working on in the Milky Way probably doesn't smell too good. Number five, Lord Neferti Room. For this next piece of evidence, we'll be directing our focus to the land down under. Australian aliens, baby, let's do it. In the Brisbane Water National Park, to be specific. Egyptian hieroglyphs educate us on our past. There's still so much we don't know, but it's fun to find UFO looking objects within them. It's fun to speculate as we are right now. But when Egyptian texts appear around the world in the middle of nowhere, those UFO hieroglyphs get a bit more concerning. Like the Gosford glyphs, for example. Discovered in the 1970s at Karyong, there's around 300 engravings spread over two sandstone walls. The hieroglyphs are strikingly similar to that of Egypt. There's birds, even the markings of a scarab, which are those Milky Way poop pushers that I just talked about earlier. Egyptologist Raymond Johnson believes that this is the burial site of Egyptian royal family member Lord Nefertiti Ru, who met his fate around 2600 BC, with some panels telling the story of two prince brothers who came from Egypt and subsequently became shipwrecked. But other panels get into the extraterrestrial goodness. Some of these Gosford glyphs have UFO shapes, with scarabs, birds, and sun symbols popping up as well. Maybe we did have alien aid when it came to laying these royal family members to rest. Number four, Userkaf. Remember earlier when I was talking about those extremely heavy granite coffins? Well, the Sun Temple in Egypt may give us more alien clues as to their purpose. Discovered in 1842, this was the base of a giant monument that apparently used to stand over 150 feet tall. Built by the pharaoh Yuzakaf, founder of the 5th dynasty of Egypt, the temple translates to stronghold of Ra. 
Ra being the sun god. This temple at Abu Ghraib was home to one of the world's largest monoliths, and its purpose may blow your mind. This obelisk was built out of granite. Now they made things out of granite back then because it contained quartz. Quartz, due to piezoelectricity, was able to convert the Earth's vibrations into energy. Nikola Tesla did something similar. He figured out standing waves, which was the ability to pass energy through the air. Perhaps these granite monoliths were used to teleport people or goods. That would explain the last point about those Australian glyphs. To be fair, I have zero idea how Bluetooth works either. Alien airdropped in Egypt. I'm here for this theory. Number three, Khufu. In order to become a god in the afterlife, these kings would build massive temples or pyramids. The Giza pyramids were built over 4,500 years ago, and to this day, they draw in about 15 million visitors a year. Pharaoh Khufu's is the largest pyramid in Giza, and it was the first pyramid that they started to build, obviously taking the longest. Reaching up to 147 meters high, it took 2.3 million rocks to create this landmark, and its alignment with Orion's belt gives it an extraterrestrial vibe, and with Tesla CEO Elon Musk tweeting aliens built the pyramids, obvi, we now have to ask just how did thousands of workers achieve this? The placement of the pyramid is also unique as well. It's aligned perfectly with the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. That much accuracy back then with the stars and the earth and the heavens, they must have gotten help from alien friends or else they had the world's biggest protractor. Number two, King Tut. Only a few years after King Tut's tomb was discovered in the Valley of the Kings, archeologist Howard Carter found two daggers that were buried with said king. It's not uncommon to be buried with your goods. It's why Egyptians would build these tombs in a certain way, so that grave robbers wouldn't snoop around and steal your entire family heritage. It was made so nothing could get out, which is insane. But two daggers were found with King Tut, one made of iron and the other gold. Now with iron being even more rare than gold in the Bronze Age, this was a big deal. And with recent advancements in technology, we were able to use a technique called portable X-ray fluorescence spectrometry. And according to the journal Meteorites in the Planetary Science, the blade is actually made of iron, nickel, and cobalt, suggesting that this material is of extraterrestrial origin. And finally, number one, the Great Pyramid of Cholula. There are many parallels between Egyptian and Maya civilizations. The two cultures are so far apart, both in time and distance, and they also never made contact. But both pyramids are made with steps, and both have stone serpents. The vault arches are also strikingly similar, and hieroglyphs within share a lot of the same symbolism. These hieroglyphs include advanced mathematics that they say was bestowed upon them also from these sky gods. Was this just one landing site of our alien ancestors? Let us know in the comments below all your thoughts. Kicking off the list at number 10, Ramses II. Ramses II, part two, you see what I'm doing here. He's considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest pharaoh of the 19th dynasty. Ramses II is still considered the ruler of rulers. It's not a bad title, not bad at all. In year 30 of his reign, Ramses II was ritually transformed into an Egyptian god. Not bad, I'm turning 30 in a few years. I hope someone turns me into a god or gets me like a bike, <laughs> one of the two, I'll take both. So it was only fair that the spoiled pharaoh erected a bunch of statues of himself. Yeah, big selfies. Ramses put up more selfies than any other pharaoh in history. Most famous of them, the temples of Abu Simbel. There lies a monument dedicated to the late Queen Nefertiti and the Ramesseum. We kicked off a part one with Ramses signing the first ever peace treaty, so, so for part two, we had to show some of the glamour side of him, you know? Number nine, over 100 children. Who is this guy, Nick Cannon? Ramses II is the father to over 100 children. Uh, with that, of course, came the, you know, 200 wives. Otherwise, ow and how, if it was just one person. Ow and how, you know? <laughs> it's guesstimated that Ramses had 96 sons and 60 daughters. Of all those children, Ramses outlived a lot of them. It's almost like living as a king helped, perhaps, maybe, I don't know. Maybe you ate better. Maybe, just a hint. Just an idea. Eventually, Ramses was succeeded by his 13th son with his favorite queen, Queen Nefertari, giving her the fanciest tomb in the Valley of the Queens. Nefertari's tomb contains paintings that some consider are the greatest works of ancient Egyptian art. Not bad, I had like baseball wallpaper on mine growing up. Tomb QV66, he spoiled his lady, look at this. We gotta love him. Her tomb is 520 square meters covered in beautiful art, but in 1904, when Nefertari's tomb was rediscovered, all that was found was her mummified knees. Yeah, all that was left was her kneecaps. What, like, who does this? Raiders had stolen all the treasure prior, sometime in the many moons she had been lying there, and they even took her body and left her knees. Like, what? Monsters. 
They're like, yeah, grab the treasure, leave the patellas. Let's do it. Number eight, ready to strike. Pharaohs may have looked beautiful living in after death, but they meant business, okay? They were protective of their land, their family, their many, many lovers and children. The symbol often worn by pharaohs were symbols of power, a nemes crown. This crown was a striped headcloth and the back of their head was covered with an aureus symbol aka an upside down cobra. The cobra symbol represents that the pharaoh is always ready and willing to attack their enemies. Attack them with venom. It's a pretty cool symbol. Mine just says DC Etnies Shoes. I'm like, I don't, this says fight me if anything. DC Skate Shop in my back. I'm like, yeah, you can just attack me, that's cool. Number seven, King Teddy. The Pyramid of Teddy was built for the first ruler of the 6th dynasty. While it's not as flashy or massive as other pyramids, inside it contains the oldest writing ever, in the religious world that is. Inside it contains the pyramid texts, these legendary texts. They go all the way back to 2400 BC. The pyramid texts were specifically written so that this king, King Teddy, could ascend to the heavens after his death. This isn't bizarre behavior by any means, but King Teddy, he was specific. He wanted to be a star like a literal star. There are spells and incantations that are in this tomb meant to free the king's soul as he arrives in the cosmos. More specifically for Teddy to become a star in the sky and join Osiris and Orion in the hashtag God Squad. There's even instructions on how to preserve the body and travel to these heavens. It's one thing to be buried with your gold, then you can live another life, but to become a star, I need to expand my dreams, my gosh. King Teddy was onto something here. When I go in my will, I'm gonna be like, can I become a star, is that possible? Can I just throw me up into the heavens? Can I do that? Or bury me, that's cool. Bury me in Ajax, that works. <laughs> Number six, Yozer. For this one, we're looking into some bull worshiping. So if you're a fan of bulls, here, this one's perfect for you, weirdly enough. Just north of the Step Pyramid of Pharaoh Dozier, archeologist August Mariette discovered this site in 1851. The Serapium, it's a temple dedicated to the Egyptian deity Serapis, and it's a combination of Osiris and Apis in human form. This was a large burial ground for the Apis bulls, these bulls that were said to be sacred, of course, and after their death, they would become immortal. Immortal bulls, that sounds badass and also terrifying, that's very scary. Don't wear red around these guys. Today at Saqqara, there's a massive vault, it's 382 yards long, and it's carved out of sandstone bedrock, it's huge, and along the sides, there's 24 chambers, each with a sarcophagus carved out of a single chunk of granite. Just impossible craftsmanship all around, especially at these times, like, oh my god, my wrists are tired just typing about this, let alone doing this. Inside these boxes were animal remains, bones and all that jazz, but back in those times, you weren't allowed to break up any bodies. You had to mummify them, right? Hence part one and where we are now. How are these tombs built so perfectly, weighing over 80 tons, and also, where do these bones come from? I have so many questions. Maybe on part three we'll answer them. Number five, we love cats. I am allergic to cats, but I still go for it. I still pet them. I risk everything just to... Yes, I don't care. I ruined my entire weekend just to get my face all up in their whiskers. Nobody did it like ancient Egyptians. You've probably heard this at one point or another. They worshipped cats. They were like, you know, the legendary <laughs> cats. That was, that was their thing. I'm more of a golden retriever guy, but I get it. They're cute. They respected them. They worshipped them. Even though at the time, dogs were respected for being hunters, cats were still considered magical creatures. It's because they just stare at shit randomly. Mid-conversation, a cat will just be like... No, they're not magical, they're terrifying. They're on something. If you had a cat, you had good luck, apparently. A friend of mine has two fat cats. He has some pretty good luck, I think. If they're fat, they're good, hmm. When a cat passed away back in ancient Egyptian times, they too were mummified. You would think that alone was just plenty of respect, but ancient Egyptians and pharaohs, they would obviously go a step further. Hence this fun list. After their cat died, they would shave their eyebrows off and would mourn them until they grew back. That's like three and a half months of cat depression. That's wild. That's, I, I got over my childhood animal in like six business days. It's not a bad thing, it's just that's a long time, you know? Next time your friend tells you their cat passed away, tell them if they really love them, they would shave their eyebrows. Test them. Number four, ancient Photoshop. When we look back at ancient artwork, we see these kings and queens, well, all the pharaohs were considered kings, but it was equal at the time. And they all look athletic. They all look like these warriors, right? They look to be in great shape. When in reality, a lot of these pharaohs were probably pretty overweight or unhealthy. I mean, think about it. If you slam wine and bread all day, plus a little dab of honey every eight minutes, you're gonna gain some weight. Yeah, that's how it goes. Many of these ancient pharaohs did have diabetes, and Queen Hatshepsut, who was alive during the 15th century BC, her sarcophagus shows her as slim and strong and all that jazz, but almost all historians agree that she was out of shape and quite unhealthy. Honestly, 
Fair, I would do the exact same thing. She was ahead of her time. If somebody was like, hey, I'm gonna make a statue for you, what should I make it look like? I'm like, no, yeah, give him an eight pack, make him jacked, I don't know. Make him look like Michael Jordan, I don't know. Number three, gender reveal parties. Okay, we've seen all these videos online. A guy goes to swing and hit a baseball. He misses, it hits the ground. There's a big pink cloud of smoke. Everyone's like, oh my God. Gender reveal parties, right? They're pretty popular. Turns out they are popular back in ancient Egyptian days, but nobody did it like them. Also, nobody started any wildfires back then when any uh, ancient Egyptians did it, so that's nice. We should go take a note from them. Back in the day, Egyptians had a pretty interesting method for predicting the gender of a newborn. You would have to use wheat and barley seeds. You would have to pee on them. And then, however it grew, that would determine the sex. I would feel bad. First of all, I'd be like, hi, we're curious. Don't mind us. I'm just gonna pee on your crops, sir. Let us know how it grows. We're really aiming towards a boy this time. We have 96 girls, so we're gonna try a couple of boys. Yeah, depending on how the crops grew, they could accurately predict the sex of the child. And it worked a lot of the time. It's pretty wild. We went from watering crops to burning them down just to find out a gender. Hashtag it's a boy. Number two, more tattoos. More tattoos for number two. We love it. You guys saw what I did. Ancient Egyptians worshipped animals. We talked about that, the whole cat stuff and the whole hippo situation in part one, that was violent. But what about baboons? Did they get any love? Baboons, I say it weird, baboons, baboons. They were pretty important pieces to this ancient Egyptian puzzle. Some mummies were found with tattoos of baboons on their bodies. One of the most strange things pharaohs did back in ancient Egyptian days was train baboons to make arrests. Yep, stop resisting, you're going to jail. Me and seven baboons, let's carry them into the car, bam. Imagine stealing food for your family just to like try and get by and four baboons pop out, start doing parkour and then arrest you in front of everyone. That'd be so embarrassing and also alarming. They train baboons to pick fruit, make beer and even entertain. Yeah, these baboons were the life of the party. Apparently if their dance moves alone would be reason enough to get a tattoo of one of my arms, honestly. Going all crazy, throwing their own at people, I'd be like, yeah, right here or here. I don't care. And finally, number one, the afterlife. One of the most fascinating parts about these ancient Egyptian pharaohs is that they would pass away literally covered in gold, head to toe. It's nice to know that this long ago, some of these kings and queens still rest untouched by grave robbers or explorers. The afterlife for these pharaohs was important. And as soon as they take on the throne, work is immediately underway on their tomb. That's a little grim when you think about it. It's like, hey, congratulations. We're gonna start making where you're gonna be buried. It's like. Thanks, I think. These monuments took time, but they were built to last, and clearly, they have. Pharaoh's eyes were painted black with coal. They did this so that they would look like the god Horus after they passed on. Number 10, mummies. This should come as no surprise to anyone, but yeah, mummies. While not the first and not the last civilization to mummify their friends and family, ceasing to exist, they are probably most known for it. Well, that and maybe the pyramids. The Pyramids are pretty cool, I guess. The process of mummifying or preserving the body was thought to be important for the soul during the afterlife. If the vessel or your body was not intact, then your soul could get lost. Therefore, if you want the pharaoh to live forever in the afterlife, then you must pickle and preserve the mighty king. I don't want my soul getting lost. Number 9. 40 Year Old's Worst Nightmare Despite my best efforts and anti-aging cream, there will come a time when I will be old. Personally, I'm not worried about putting some mileage on. That's life. However, something I am concerned about is the effects of aging. Have you ever just noticed that you ain't as limber as you used to be? You get tired easily. And if you have more than three beers, you have to lay down for three days. However, something that happens to a lot of men reaching their 40s is a little trouble in the bedroom. This was an issue in ancient Egypt, except sadly, there wasn't a messed up process to fix impotence. I know, right? That's crazy. You thought I was gonna say something weird like wrap a snake around it or something, but no. When in modern times, the cute waitress at the golf clubhouse just doesn't get your blood pumping anymore, you could reach for a small blue pill that everybody knows. Egyptians did not possess such luxuries and instead prayed for the peace deal to work. Dear Desert Jeebus, please make my wiener work again. Thank you. Number eight, ahead of their time. Ancient Egyptians just may have been ahead of their time and didn't know it. The Egyptians had tons of different herbs, plants, and methods for treating all kinds of ailments. Their alchemy skill was maxed out. I never did that. However, one method they came up with may have been helping more than they thought. A porridge mixture that was boiled down that contained tetracycline, which just in case you didn't know, is known as an antibiotic. This would have been very helpful for the time, as a scrape on the knee could be the difference between living and 
well, not living. While this was being used, it's unsure if the Egyptians really knew why this method worked. We doubt they understood the finite details of antibiotics, and I'm not gonna stand here and pretend that I do either, because I don't. Number seven, Tales from the Crypt Keeper. <laughs> you didn't think I was gonna talk about mummies and not talk about how they make them, right? Hold on to your spittoons, this is gonna be a rough one. Okay, so we all know that when we pass on, our bodies begin to decay and break down. The Egyptians knew this, so they would have to be one step ahead if they were to have the king pickled in time for the afterlife. Well, first things first, the brains? They gotta go. They would remove the brain with a large spike and sort of just, sort of mash it up there and just, well then they drain the contents from the nose, which, that is just disgusting. Stomach, colon, and lungs, well, those won't be needed in the afterlife either, so they gotta go too. But the heart? The heart stays though. That's where the soul is. The king was then dried out with mounds of alkaline salt and the world's best beef jerky impression. Afterwards, oils were rubbed into the skin and eventually a resin was applied to aid in the linen wrap sticking to the body. Making for that distinct Tupperware brand airtight seal. The pickled king was wrapped numerous more times just to be safe and then, if he was OG enough, placed into a sarcophagus. And if you're really cool, you'll get your own room full of gold and treasures and your pet whiskers which is a cat, and be mummified because, well, you need him in the afterlife too. That is one heck of an undertaking process. And to be fair, it kind of worked because there have been a few mummies recovered from Egypt and they're in amazing condition, considering the age, of course. Number six, a little off the top. Okay, without the comment section oversharing here, some people have had circumcisions and some haven't. It's a part of life, okay? Just. That's how it goes. Debatable to some, but it happens. This was a common practice in ancient Egypt, claimed to be for hygiene reasons. However, there's something a little bit different about their process. See, today it happens when you're a baby. A strange man comes in the room, and he cuts what he has to cut. It's done, there it is. That's it, it's over. Egyptians waited a little longer, however, closer to the age of 12 or 13. Can you imagine just chilling in the field one day and then some strange dude grabs you and slaps you down on the table and makes a withdrawal from you to meat and veg? I talked to the chief today and he just said that's that's not it. Don't don't do that. Number 5, bloodletting. The practice of bloodletting was common all over the world, but it may have gotten its start in ancient Egypt. It's a quite simple procedure, really. Black bile out of whack. Lose some blood. Can't stop coughing and sneezing? Drain some blood. Been possessed by demons and now they curse and haunt you as they run up and down your bloodstream? Drain some blood. The question is, however, was this really helping? The short answer, no. No, it wasn't. Besides feeling lightheaded and going pale, this didn't really achieve much. Since the days of old were filled with all kinds of other ailments that would easily end someone's life before the spooky demons running up and down someone's bloodstream ever would. I don't feel good. Oh, we better bleed grandpa again. I don't know, like what? Number four, plastic surgery. Hey, there's nothing wrong with a little cosmetic surgery. I for one feel that if it'll make you feel better, go for it. Feel better about yourself, do it. I don't think there's any shame in that. It's been around for a long time, so long that ancient Egyptians might have come up with the first nose jobs. Obviously not like the ones today, but they were knowledgeable in surgeries. After all, you open the chest cavity of a dozen kings and you jot some stuff down on some papyrus, you learn a thing or two. More interesting than shaving down your own beak, however, was their implementation of the prosthesis limbs. Yes, all the way back then. One mummy was actually found with a fake toe. When tested in the modern day with period accurate sandals, it proved to work quite well and move more efficiently than first thought. Again, for the time, this was pretty advanced. Number three, the Ode of the Nile. Imagine people working all day in the blistering sands of Egypt, where the sun beams down on you like well, the sun in the desert, lifting massive rocks and carving them to shape. I don't know about you guys, but I would be sweating. And that also means I wouldn't be smelling too fresh, resembling that of a high school locker room. Yuck. Well, the Egyptians knew this was an issue, so they came up with what was probably the first underarm deodorant using nice herbs and other items that had pleasant aromas and stuck them where the odor was coming from. In ya bits. I just know that after a long day of hard labor in the sun, I would need more than cinnamon sticks and lavender to tame the odor of my sweaty lumberjack armpits. That's just how it goes. Number two, the Egyptian Brazilian. The 70s have come and gone, and a popular trend today is to be hairless everywhere, even in places where you didn't think it was possible to grow hair when you were younger. Egyptians took it upon themselves to remove all their hair. 
Well, at least most of it. Not because the Nile River had nice beaches, but because of lice. Oh, yuck. While not an exact cure for the itchy bugs that plague schools across America, it did seem to help. And if you've ever had lice before, you know how bad that sucks. I had them once, it was the worst. She cut my hair, shaved, shaved my head, lots of baths. It's just, it's, it's no fun, man. I'm too cute for that, I don't want that. Number one, Wario breath. Wow, okay. It makes sense that Egyptians would come up with breath mints and mouthwash. They fed their laborers diets of foods that contained a lot of onions and garlic. Sure, I'm just like everyone else who cooks. And when the recipe asks for one onion, Eh, maybe I put in two. When I asked for two cloves of garlic, maybe I put in four. You gotta love that flavor. It was thought that they helped fight off disease, and they were kinda right. However, after eating all that flavor, your breath would be something rancid. So herbs and mints were used to help quell the breath that could peel the paint off of walls. Thank God. Number 10, false doors. Okay, right off the bat, imagine searching for a lost Egyptian tomb, all right? Imagine you've spent years of your life dedicating to this research, and then you find a door. You find an entrance carved into the wall, and this is it. What lies beyond? It's time. You try and carefully open it with a team of archaeologists, but it won't budge, because it's a fake door. It's a false door. Yeah, just a Looney Tunes door. Somebody juked you out 4,500 years ago. Gotcha. Their spirit's been waiting that long to be like, nice, idiot. All right, we can go. We're good. False doors in Egyptian tombs were quite common in ancient Egyptian times. But if we look elsewhere throughout history, we find false doors in ancient Rome, in both tombs and the interior of homes. So that ought to be confusing for any house guests back then. It's also important to note that Egyptian culture was influenced by Mesopotamian architecture. So we've had fake doors around for a while now. A lot of confusing people for thousands of years. Ancient Egyptians believed that these false doors were a connection to the dead, and that spirits were able to travel here and there throughout living and death. Most false doors can be found on the West Wall because Egyptians believed the West to be the land of the dead. Number nine, the Tomb of Uzer. Back in March 2010, the Egyptian Supreme Council of Antiquities released this photo. This six foot tall slab of pink granite was carved over 3,500 years ago, and this door was found near Karnak Temple in Luxor, and originally it belonged to the chief minister of Queen Hatshepsut back in the 15th century. Now, Uzer was a high ranking official and held the position of vizier for 20 years at that time, so in turn, he got his own fancy tomb located on the west bank of the Nile. Remember, Egyptians associate the west with the land of the dead. That's gonna come in quite a few times in this video. The actual slab of granite, this door, was found far away from its home. It had been moved thousands of years later and ended up in an ancient Roman era building. Never thought I'd have to say this, but um, don't steal doors from the dead. Got it? Okay, let's move on. Number eight, Alexandria Black Tomb. What if we found a tomb and then just opened it, you know? What if we found a mysterious black granite tomb in Alexandria, say back in 2018? Do you think it would be wise to just open it because we're curious? Spoiler alert, we opened it and it was exactly what we thought it was going to be. When archaeologists found this massive tomb untouched for over thousands of years, on one hand, yeah, that's a feat in itself, but us humans, we're curious creatures. We just gotta, just a little peek just to see who's in there. I mean, after all, it could be Alexander the Great, right? That's the whole point of all this. Egyptian news outlet El Watan reported that the tomb was lifted only a few centimeters before every official involved at that construction site just fled the scene. They straight up just ran away. It smelled that bad. Mustafa Waziri, Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities, this guy put his entire head in the tomb just to show us that it's safe. That's great. I mean, you could use your hand, maybe even a foot, I guess, just a little foot dip. But straight to the head dipping? Come on, Mr. Waziri, be smart about this. Number seven, Valley of the Kings. While March 2020 wasn't the best month of all time by any means, Egyptian officials did locate a secret vault hiding in the sands of the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. Just off the west bank of the Nile, the Valley of the Kings, as its name hints towards, is a pretty historical part of Egypt's past. Again, do we want to open this vault? Probably not, but did we? Yes. Bones and goo and history. What do you know? Surprise, surprise. Number six, 2020 tombs. Summer 2020, nice. While most of us was stuck inside watching Netflix, more than 100 sealed coffins were found. And yes, they were occupied for the most part. Found, of course, in Saqqara, Egypt, Egyptian archeologists have never been more excited. Maybe we'll find the body of Cleopatra. Wouldn't that just be dandy? The fact that we found over 100 of these still in great shape is mind blowing. 
Grave robbers have been around since ancient Egyptian days, and for all these to be untouched for this long is honestly unbelievable. These findings date back to 712 BC, which was a period where Egypt was controlled by foreign civilizations. That's what makes this so insane. Like Persians and Greeks, they were all around at this time. The idea that we're finding mummies is great and all, but again, do we need to open all of them up? Maybe there's treasure, maybe there's bodies. Either way, it's not yours. <laughs> Am I insane? Maybe I'm insane. Do we need to find Alexander the Great this badly that we're willing to disrespect this many souls in the process? Number five, Luxor tomb. We've been saying 2,500 years ago, and don't get me wrong, that's an awful long time to go. But in 2014, archeologists discovered a 4,000 year old tomb from the 11th dynasty. Tucked away in Luxor, Egypt, of course as this list says. Spanish archeologists found a tomb belonging to a leader from the 11th dynasty, and it's pretty obvious that this was somebody from the royal family or somebody who was a high ranking official, because at the time, Luxor was the capital city of ancient Egypt. And officials also believe this tomb could have been used as a mass grave. The important thing to note here is that the tomb had also been used during the 17th dynasty because tools and utensils from that later time were also found in this grave. We're gonna find a spork in 5,000 years and be like, ah yes, ancient tools, interesting. Number four. 210 sarcophagi. So we thought it was a pretty big deal when 160 bodies were recently discovered in Egypt. This was back in September 2020. Over 160 coffins were found. Wild, right? Well, those are rookie numbers, turns out. For this one, archeologists found 210 sarcophagi near Queen Nefertiti's funerary temple in the city of the dead, Saqqara. Yeah, there were over 160, surprise. Maybe next time you check in with us, that number will be even higher, who knows? Hopefully, slash maybe hopefully not. I don't know how I feel about this. This was January 2020. We probably would have seen it on the news, but that was when 768 people were storming the capital, so the news was a bit busy, I guess. Thanks. These sealed coffins were untouched for thousands of years. They went from finding 160 to finding 210. That's incredible. According to the ministry, the sarcophagi were completely closed and haven't been opened since they were buried at all. They opened a few though, of course, just to analyze and display them, but that's it. Yeah, leave the rest. I'm not focused on ancient curses or Brennan Fraser having to come out and save the day. Just let dead people lay where they are, let them rest. The amount of effort got into hiding and preserving their memory alone. I mean, look how long it's taken for us to even find these things. It's almost like they didn't want to be found. Number three, the ancient curse. The walls of some of these tombs have warnings from the gods, which is a lot. One of them warning trespassers that the gods will wring their neck like that of a goose. Also, if I walked into somebody's property now and it said trespassers next will be wrung out like a goose, I would turn back. I wouldn't want to investigate further. I would just walk away. You don't need to be an ancient god to get that message across, you know what I mean? But inside the found tomb of the vizier Ankhamor, a pharaoh's official from 4,000 years ago, a curse was written. Buried in a mastaba, an above ground massive tomb, was this warning. Might do against this, my tomb, the same shall be done to your property. It also warns of the vizier's knowledge of secret spells and magic, and threatens to fill impure intruders with a fear of seeing a ghost. Yeah, there's that or beware of dog. I don't know, you can pick which is more impactful on your property, sure. Number two, the animal tombs. This tomb was found, as you may have guessed, in the Valley of the Kings. You're getting good, nice. But this one doesn't sound like the rest. I mean, for starters, it's a number rather than a name. What in the Elon Musk is happening here? Whose name was a number, huh? KV-52 was discovered in 1906 by Edward Ayrton. Tomb KV-50, KV-51, and this one, KV-52, they all form a group referred to as the animal tombs. Underneath six feet of debris, the entrance to these vaults were found. So when we enter this tomb, specifically KV-52, that's been untouched, ideally, for thousands of years, we can look forward to finding anything. In fact, whatever we do find, it's a win. It helps complete this age-long puzzle. So when officials opened KV-52 and it was completely empty, well, that doesn't feel too nice. Something here is wrong. It was empty except for two boxes. Both were black and undecorated, which is odd considering what we've learned on this list. The larger of the two contained the remains of a monkey and the smaller one was a canopic chest that had four compartments in it. Hauntingly bare compared to what else we've seen on this list, but it gets a little better. We're not done yet. Finally, number one, Queen Nefertiti's hidden chamber. When researchers are 90% sure about something, that's a pretty good sign. You only say you're 90% sure of something when you know for sure, for sure. You leave 10% in case anything else goes wrong out of your control, right? 90%, that's confident, we got this. So when Egyptian authorities said they're 90% sure there's a hidden chamber in King Tut's tomb, well, we got a little jazzed, a little, got some jazz hands going on. Not gold, jazz hands. Back in 2015, a paper was published on the burial of Queen Nefertiti. Archaeologist Nicholas Reeves argued that while conducting scans on the ancient site, Reeves found what resembled traces of doors beneath the plaster. 
Now, it's been considered previously by archaeologists that King Tut's mask, having ear piercings and all, suggests that at that time, that tomb and that death mask was actually meant for Queen Nefertiti, not King Tut. But because King Tut died suddenly when he was 19, plans had to quickly change. 90% sure is good enough for me. What do you guys think? Comment down below all your thoughts. Number 10, bowling. Where would we be as a species if we didn't spend the entirety of the 1990s in bowling alleys and arcades? In later years, they seem to have fallen out of style, and for the life of me, I can't figure out why. Where else for $20 a person can you spend time in a large building with the heat on and the youngest people besides you and your friends is a league of retiree bowlers saying questionable things in the lane beside you. A blue carpet with planets and rocket ships has the same amount of character as the musky clown shoes you wear as you approach the snack stand. A waff of radioactive nacho cheese assaults your nose as the bubblegum chewing student behind the counter asks if you want another room temperature domestic beer. <laughs> nice. The foam and bacteria forming in your stomach is a classic tale of a bowling alley tucked away in a Midwest snow-covered state. <laughs> nice. Now, with my colorful depiction aside, let's get to the history. None of that glory would be possible without the Egyptians. Yes, they invented bowling. No nacho cheese and weird animations on the TV, but it was still bowling. The ball was made of rope and leather, or sometimes rock, as were the pins. Throw it at the pins. Simple. That's it. That's bowling. <laughs> Number nine, math. Oh, math. You remind me of a simpler time. A time when I was bawling my eyes out while my dad asked me over and over again, what is nine times three? Expecting me to come up with the answer under the enormous weight of patriarchal pressure. 27, dad, it's 27. While the ancient Greeks usually get credit for coming up with mathematics, they actually took it from the Egyptians across the Mediterranean. And then yes, they improved upon it. The Egyptians used a numeral system that helped them solve equations involving multiplication and the absolutely disgusting fractions. These guys understood concepts such as geometry and algebra, and they were the first civilization to develop and solve second degree quadratic equations. I don't even know what that means. I wonder if there was ever a little ancient Egyptian boy who got yelled at at the ancient dinner table by his ancient father about finding the circumference of a circle in the middle of the night. Probably. Number eight, papyrus. I heard Egyptians like paper. Well, you're gonna be doing a lot of paper rolling when you're living in a van down by the river. Huh, strange, I, I think I've heard that somewhere before. Yes, the Egyptians gave the world papyrus, which eventually would become paper. Writing stuff down before this was very difficult. It was inscribed in clay or stone tablets. That's hard. How is a stenographer supposed to do their job? Or when you get mad at an office printer for not working? You can't just break the tablet. We've all been there before, and if I were to make a list of the most important inventions of all time, paper would be on that list. Number seven, black ink. So you make papyrus paper, but what the heck are you gonna use to write on it? Ink, you're gonna use ink, obviously. That's right, the ancient Egyptians actually invented ink. Now, they weren't the only ones, the Chinese also invented ink around the same time as well. But this video ain't about them. The ink used by the Egyptians was made from soot and ash from burning wood or oil mixed with water. Some of their inks even contained lead that would help ancient Egyptians bind the ink to the paper. But they didn't just use black. They had red inks made from iron-based compounds as well as blue, green, white, and yellow. It was a colorful place and they were likely a colorful people. Number six, the haircut. A little off the top, Ramses. Honestly, it's time for me to get a haircut too. Is there any mommy out there willing to cut a blue-eyed boy's hair? I wish. I could go for some home cooking too. Anyway, I digress. Yes, the Egyptians very well may have invented the haircut or at least regular grooming practices. Having long hair just wasn't in their culture and honestly, in the hot sun and sands of Egypt, can you blame them? I don't think so. When I was younger, I used to have my head shaved. I thought it looked good. It kinda did, but the main reason I did it was because it kept me cool, it was functional. It may surprise you that yes, we got hot summers in Canada. So I can understand why the Egyptians did that. That being said, they did manage to keep some of their facial hair because beards are like makeup for men. We just look better with them. We look, we look good. It's a good look. Number five, the plow. Back in the day when we started to move away from the hunter-gatherer lifestyle to more of a work the land and make a new farm lifestyle, Omari would go out into the field with his hoe and cultivate his land by hand. As you can imagine, this takes a hell of a long time, but we're a problem-solving species. That's why we got to where we are now. Enter the plow and the evolution of agriculture. 
So basically, you take your two favorite oxen and you connect them together, and you connect them to a beam of wood that shoots out behind to the plow handle and to the blade of the plow that would go into the ground and be dragged behind by the ox, breaking up the ground. All the farmer has to do is sow the seed. This simple invention changed everything, and it's still used in places where machinery is just unaffordable. Number four, the calendar. No one would blame you if in the last two years you forgot what day it was. I know after spending a lot of time inside, I forgot what day it was, but every day is a Saturday when you eat spicy chicken wings in your tidy whities well, the Egyptians may have had one of the first calendars, and a gosh darn good one too. Their calendar had 12 months and over 300 days. The trouble is, after a while it kind of got a little inaccurate. They did their best to fix it. I mean, clearly, if you look at the calendar, I mean, clearly it's the, it's the fifth of, uh, well, I think that looks like three men walking in sand. And next month we have a special festival happening. It looks like it'll be a sunny day on the 12th of uh, man with ball on, on his hat. H hieroglyphs are hard, man, I don't know. Number three, clocks. All right, so I'm not going to sit here and tell you the Egyptians invented the modern clock, no. But they did have to tell time, and as any dad or survival guru will tell you, the most reliable way to tell what time of the day it is would be that massive floating ball of plasma in the sky, the sun, assuming it isn't a super cloudy day or anything. The obelisks we see in Egypt were not just fancy deco pieces. They were actually sun clocks, used to see how the sun would cast shadows throughout different times of the day. They even used it to figure out which days were longer and shorter. There was an even more interesting clock though, a water clock. It was basically a stone vessel with a tiny little hole at the bottom which allowed water to drip at a constant rate. The water marks spaced out at different levels would tell you how many hours had passed. This one's good because it worked at night and on cloudy days as well. Number two, mummification. Welcome back to the land of the living, my friend. You've been gone for quite some time. <laughs> oh. Yes, the process of mummification, probably the number one thing ancient Egypt is known for, maybe besides the pyramids. While not the only civilization of the past to practice this, they kind of ran the show here. Basically, the pharaoh's corpse has to stay fresh so their soul can make it into the afterlife. The heart stays, but everything else is like a furniture after a bad divorce. It must go. The brain was stirred up like a family reunion square dance and drained like last night's punch bowl. But wait, horror fans, there's more. Lungs, liver, bladder, intestines, stomach, kidney, and basically anything you can scoop out with your favorite ice cream scoop is going. But don't toss them out though. Some of these organs were preserved in jars. Makes nice decorations beside the piles of gold found in the tombs. Yes, my liver jars. Oh, yes. Number one, cosmetic makeup. The ancient Egyptians created makeup as far back as 4000 BC. That's a long time ago. And that's how long we've been obsessed with our looks. Yikes. Their makeup actually served more of a purpose than just looking good though. The eye makeup they used specifically was believed to cure eye diseases, which wasn't true, and would protect them from the evil eye, which, I don't know, could have been true. Kind of like the ink, they would use soot, but they would combine it with a lead mineral called galena to create a black substance they called coal. That's K-H-O-L, not C-O-A-L. They had multiple colors actually. They would make green makeup by combining malachite with galena. Now, if you saw our bizarre beauty products and history video, you probably know that lead, even lead minerals like galena, aren't really great for you. But hey, anything in the name of looking good. Kicking off our list at number 10, Ancient Egyptian Eyeliner. Whenever you see hieroglyphics or any art depicting the great pharaohs, they're usually rocking some impressive eyeliner. They look great, right? Like a 90s pop star, they look awesome. Ancient Egyptians were the OG eyeliner users. They made their own eyeliner from lead salts. And no, before you think about getting creative, do not try this at home. This wasn't an ideal process. See, for starters, these salts were quite high in lead concentration. So, in order to avoid that mess, Ancient Egyptians first had to process and then filter that lead salt for up to 30 days in order to get the lead levels low enough to even be applied. So you had to plan accordingly. They're like, oh, I have a pharaoh date in 30 days? Perfect, we'll start now. It was a hazard if done incorrectly. Not only was this ancient beauty practice, well, beautiful to look at, but Egyptians also needed eyeliner to protect against sun damage as well as fight off any infections. Yeah, we don't encourage rubbing lead on your eyes today. We have a few different methods on, you know, how to look good. 
I think. None of them include lead, hopefully, ideally. Number nine, hair gel. Back in my day in high school, I had to use Dippity Doo Extra Hold Hair Gel. Yeah, I showed a scale on the side. I always got the five out of six hold. That was good. Six was too much. Nobody ever did the full six. That's crazy talk. But in ancient Egypt, we didn't have styling, spiking glue, and blasting free spray by DJ Polly D. No, we have that today, unfortunately, but back then, a little different. Back then, ancient Egyptians loved styling their hair, but again, before DJ Polly D was born, what is a pharaoh to do? If the Great Pyramids are any indication, they knew something that we didn't. Ancient Egyptians knew how to keep their hair in one place all day long. And that heat too, how do you do it? My curls, I'm jealous. Their hair styling gel was made with shea butter and coconut oil. But more often than not, they would replace coconut oil with almond oil. So this was a completely natural and strengthening styling gel. Cut to today, we have whatever that is. Psst, ice spray, that's awesome. DJ Polly. psst. No. Number eight, coffee scrub. I love coffee. I don't think I love coffee enough to do a coffee face scrub, but hey, never say never. I'll try anything once. Ancient Egyptians would use coffee scrub to reduce inflammation, improve blood circulation, and since it's a ground up material, it's gonna remove those dead skin cells at the same time. Next holiday season, grab your aunt some coffee scrub. Just tell her how it reduces puffiness, improves the skin's texture, all that good stuff. It'll give you that youthful feral look that you've been going for, you know what I mean? Merry Christmas, here you go, coffee. On your face. Using grounded coffee powder to exfoliate your skin sounds like a new idea. It's certainly a hot trend today. But before TikTok, ancient Egyptians already knew these benefits. Damn, I'm gonna get a coffee scrub. Maybe I'll do it. I don't know. After I'm done this cup, I'll just rub it on my face at my desk and see what uh, everyone says. Number seven, dead sea salt. You'll never feel more alive than when you use dead sea salt. Here we go. Ancient Egyptians were ahead of the exfoliation game. Dare I say, they invented it. Not only were coffee scrubs a necessity, but salt from the dead sea was one of the most popular ancient Egyptian skincare products ever. We traveled far and wide for this one. Salt collected from the Dead Sea was used to exfoliate dead skin cells, and it was so well known at this point that rumor has it, Cleopatra herself would travel all the way to the Dead Sea from Egypt just to take a bath. Yeah, let's be honest, after this point, we'd all love a rejuvenating Dead Sea float. That sounds way better than what I've got at home. Well, bath, I can't even fit in this thing. Dead Sea sounds way better. I once left a house party early to go have a bath. Swear to God, York University. Dipped at like 10 o'clock. I was like, I'm cold, I'm not doing this. 40 minute walk, worth it. Leave your friends for a bath, do it. Number six, wax cones. Head cones, also known as perfume cones, were used in ancient Egypt. You've probably seen them in a thumbnail here at some point. The art depicting head cones is quite unique looking. It's like a pharaoh with a triangle on their head. You're like, what's happening there? What is this? Is this like Illuminati? What is this? Long before Pantene Pro-V, when it came to head cleanliness, these triangular wax cones were here to save the day. And they looked pretty fun to use. I don't know. They would just sit on top of your head. You didn't need to mix anything with lead for 30 days or bran or anything like that. You didn't need to put any organs in jars, just a wax cone atop of your head. Easy. Back in 2019, experts found archaeological evidence that they were in fact used. So yeah, not just a glyph real life history. So I have to bring this up. Men and women alike would wear this cone and your body heat would slowly melt the wax cone down and through your hair. The cone itself was made of oils, fat, resin. It would be placed on their wig or directly onto your head and it would keep melting and refreshing all day long. Like a little candle almost. A nice little human candle. Nice little Egyptian man candle. As fascinating as ancient Egyptian culture is, I don't think anybody misses wax cones. It's a little easier nowadays. I'm too tall too. I can't have a wax cone. Are you kidding me? It would hit this mic. No way. Number five, fake beards. I can't grow a beard, so maybe I'll just start rocking the, the fake one. You know, like Hatshepsut. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. There were just a few that were women in total, but during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male. The pharaoh, fake beard, the massive muscles, historians believe that this was all done as an act of politics. After her passing, come 1458 BC, her stepson took the throne, Thutmose III, and he destroyed everything in her name and image. Well, mostly everything. Now we have this bearded pharaoh that we're pretty sure we figured out. Number four, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with uh, an interesting method on getting rid of those pimples, that's for sure. Remind you, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, so. Again, creative. Physicians back then discussed pimples as these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin from four to five years. And by squeezing these spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots in there. I don't know. I'd be sick. See ya, now we're single. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. Hey, if a physician ever told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses on my persons, I would faint. That's the scariest news 
news I've ever heard in my life. That's some bad news, man. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taking on the properties of animals. Yeah, oh, you have acne? Hmm, are you sure you're not turning into a bird? Maybe it's that, come back next week. Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds, all to get rid of acne, hopefully. Sorry, maggots, not acne, maggots. All to get rid of maggots. I'm gonna go throw up. Number three, prosthetics. The ancient Egyptians were a culture of firsts and some of their achievements we still have no idea how they were able to accomplish. Like the pyramids, I couldn't tell you, could you? Didn't think so, hit that thumbs up. We're both wrong, we're both learning. It's very likely that some of the first ever prosthetics were used in ancient Egypt. How fascinating. Imagine being the first guy to make a toe, a fake toe. A female mummy who was discovered near Luxor had her death dated somewhere between 950 and 710 BCE. And she was also found with a prosthetic toe made from wood and leather on her person. While this of course is a wonderful cosmetic replacement and it's no secret that the ancient Egyptians certainly valued aesthetics, it seems as though this prosthetic toe was completely functional and was actually used to help this woman walk. The toe, after it was discovered, had significant signs of wear and tear, which then inspired experts to start a study, look a little further. And they did, so they took participants and tested their gait, both with and without the use of a replicated toe. And in ancient Egypt, the common footwear were sandals, and walking in them would have been uh, next to impossible without a big toe. So it's clear that this prosthetic was very helpful and important to those similar to this Luxor mummy. Not exactly a beauty practice, but I'm sure they also felt a little more confident with that toe. This is also too impressive to exclude. Beauty list. I'm like, yeah, toes are beautiful. Why not? Throw them on. Number two, henna. I got henna done a few years ago and I totally blanked. I forgot that it lasted longer than like two days. I was like, day four, I'm like, what's going on, man? Is this permanent? While on one hand, pun intended, it is beautiful, ancient Egyptians' use of henna went beyond style and beyond imaging oneself after the gods. See, henna also has cooling effects on the body, and ancient Egypt was, uh, was quite hot. It was used by ancient Egyptians to color their hair and fingernails in shades of red and orange. Now this shade, this exact shade, also provided comfort on hot days. Come back with some henna. Kind of nice. It lasts longer than a few days though, just so you know, if you want to get henna. It's important to know. That guy did not tell me in Greece. No, he did not. And finally, number one, deodorant. When it comes to deodorant, today we listen to the Old Spice guy. He's always whistling about something new. But long before he was born, ancient Egyptians Egyptians used ostrich eggs for deodorant. They made perfumes and oils, this is commonly known, but they were also the first to use any type of deodorant, like underarm deodorant. It was so impressive. Ostrich eggs mixed with a little fat and tamarisk and tortoise shell and then nuts, mix them all together and bam, there you go. You're ready for date night. Just apply all of that on your body. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. See, Egyptians would also use porridge balls. How creative is that? Flavored porridge rolled up and safely tucked in in your underarm, right there. Right there on your little smelly chicken wing. This morning I had some deodorant just crumble apart when I was applying it. You ever have that happen? Turns to feta cheese all of a sudden, mid-application. Now my bathroom sink looks like a Greek salad. Smells great, but not practical. Might have to go back to the porridge ball method. Who knows? Maybe I have one right now. Maybe that's why I haven't moved this arm the whole time. Who knows? Number 10 on our countdown, the wax crocodile will be presented in a story form. Once upon a time, as all good stories begin, a pharaoh, accompanied by his counselors and servants, paid a visit to the villa of his chief scribe, behind which there was a garden with a stately summer house and a broad artificial lake. One of the servants of the pharaoh was a handsome young man who catches the eye of the scribe's wife. She sends him gifts and they begin to have secret meetings at the summer house and swim in its lake. The chief butler informs the scribe of his wife's affair, and the scribe in turn asks the butler to bring him a magic box. Inside was a small wax crocodile that he placed in the hands of his butler, saying, cast this image into the lake behind the youth when he next bathes himself. The lovers were together in the lake the next day, and the butler stealthily put the wax croc into the water, which immediately gave it life. It became a great crocodile that seized the handsome man suddenly and took him away. Seven days passed, and the scribe tells the pharaoh of the wonder that had been done and made a request his majesty should accompany him to the villa lake. The pharaoh did so and when they both stood beside the lake in the garden, the scribe spoke magic words bidding the crocodile to appear and as he commanded so did it do. The great reptile came out of the water carrying the handsome man in its jaws. The pharaoh was filled with wonder and the scribe related on to him what had happened while the handsome man stood waiting. Could have taken his chance to run but I guess not. The pharaoh bids on to the crocodile once again to take the handsome man into the depths and neither are ever seen again. Then the pharaoh 
gave the command that the wife of the scribe should be seized, and on the north side of the house she was bound to a stake and burned alive. Now if you want to hear more wild stories like this, I recommend you subscribe to The Hive. For number 9, let's talk about the lore of the Catwoman God. Cats were very important to the ancient Egyptians and were even considered to be demi-deities. Not only did they protect the crops and slow the spread of disease by killing rodents, but they were also thought to be the physical form of the goddess Beset. The Egyptian goddess of domesticity, childbirth, the home, women's secrets, women's physical pleasure, fertility, and of course, cats. It's for this reason she's depicted as a slender and lanky woman with a cat's head. Beset was the daughter of Ra, the sister of Sekhemet, the wife of Ptah, and the mother of Mihos. It's believed that every day she would ride through the sky with her father, the sun god, and watch over and protect him. At night she would turn into a cat and continue her duty of protecting Ra, but from his greatest enemy, the serpent Apep. And since we're already talking about it, number 8 will be the serpent Apep. According to the legend, Apep was a powerful serpent deity who resided in the underworld and embodied the universe's destruction and chaos. Each night, when Ra's son Bo had to pass through the underworld before re-emerging at dawn, Apep would absolutely hound the ship in an attempt to prevent the sun from rising. Ra, the sun god and king of the gods, fought Apep every night, and the battle was always extremely intense, required all the other gods' help, and lasted the whole night. So to aid Ra in battle, the Egyptians would build wax representations of Apep and melt them in the sun. Finally, it's Beset who conquers and destroys the serpent Apep. During one of these nightly battles, Beset, being the goddess of cats, aided in Apep's defeat by utilizing her powers in a different way than she'd done before. Assuming the form of a lioness, she jumps the serpent, shredding him to pieces and scattering the bones over the underworld. From then on, Ra was tormented nightly no longer. For number 7, you're going to hear the oldest origin of Cinderella and her red slipper. Rhodopis, as she's known to modern storytellers, was a Thradican Egyptian woman slighted by fate and rewarded by royalty. First sold in Aegea, Rhodopis is passed through owners before winding up in Egypt. The Egyptian man who possesses her treats her incredibly fair. He gives her lovely homes, lavish her with other gifts, but he spent most of his time sleeping. So she's sitting on the bank of the Canopic Nile, watching robes when a falcon suddenly snatches her sandal. Rhodopis is in awe, for she knew it was the god Horus who had taken her shoe, but wondering what the Horus appearance could mean. Unbeknownst to her, however, the falcon had taken it to Memphis and dropped the sandal in the lap of none other than the pharaoh Amasis himself. Possessed by the sandal's simplicity, but beautiful red color, and being an obvious sign from the god Horus, the king sent his men in all directions of the country's quest of all directions of the country in quest of the woman who wore it. According to Greek geographer and historian Strabo in his geography book 17.33, she was found in the city of Nocritus. Hearing the trumpets and gongs of the emperor, she had hidden in the bushes while other girls tried to force their feet into her sandal. But the emperor spots her and requests she come out and try it. Naturally, Cinderella style, it only fits her, and she pulled the matching one from her robes. The pharaoh and Rhodopis are united by the god Horus, and the servant girl becomes the next queen of Egypt, to whom Herodotus, Diodorus, and Strabo say the third pyramid of Giza was attributed to. For number six, we're getting another Grecian influenced myth, that of Oedipus and the Sphinx. So, the legend of the Sphinx is a famous Egyptian myth about a creature with the head of a human woman and the body of a lion. Sometimes the Sphinx is also depicted to have wings, but that's more of a Greco Roman component. According to the story, the Sphinx was said to have been sent by the sun god Ra to guard the entrance of the city of Thebes. The Sphinx, naturally, as you may know, guarded Thebes not only with its might, but with its mind, presenting a riddle for all those who approached it. And to anyone who could not answer the riddle, they would be killed. What was the riddle? What walks on four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, and three legs in the evening? If you don't know the answer yet, I actually encourage you to pause the video and try some guesses before we continue. Let's see if the Sphinx would give you the slice and dice. Okay, so the answer is, drum roll please, a human who crawls on all fours as a baby, walks on two legs as an adult, and uses a cane in old age. Tricky, right? So the myth goes that a young prince named Oedipus, yes, the one who marries and does stuff with his mom, uh, came upon the Sphinx while traveling and he asked the riddle. Oedipus was the first person to be able to answer correctly, which angered and confused the crap out of the Sphinx, causing it to take its own life in a panic. However, some versions of the myth, the Sphinx was said to have been turned to stone by the gods. Now segueing back into the gods, number five will be about Osiris and Isis. Egyptian ruler god Ori Osiris and his wife Isis is one of the most well-known and revered myths. Osiris was renowned for his intelligence and generosity, two things his envious brother Set lacked. Vying to be king, Set lured Osiris to the Nile, where he enticed Osiris into a coffin and tossed it into the river to be swept away. Devoted wife Isis diligently searches for Osiris and discovers the coffin near Balbos, which is in modern day Lebanon. Isis returned with Osiris's body, but concealed it amongst the reeds of the Nile. However, Set had been tracking her and 
steals the coffin back and chops Osiris's corpse up and throws the pieces everywhere. Isis persisted in her quest for her husband's body. She finds all the pieces, reconstructed Osiris, and bombed his body, got pregnant off of it really quick, and brought his soul back to life with the assistance of her sister Nephesis. Osiris became the deity of the afterlife, ruling over the dead in the underworld. So naturally, that would bring us to number four, which is Horus versus Set. The story is told in the Chester Beatty Papyrus number one, Contendings of Horus and Seth, which dates back to the early Middle Kingdom, but the myth will most likely has origins even earlier than that. So upon bombing Osiris, his son Horus is conceived and then born. Thoth and Shu declare Horus the rightful ruler of Egypt, but Ra argued that Seth was more powerful, therefore deserved the throne. So cue a massive battle. First, they have a hippo breath holding competition. Isis gets involved and as a result, Horus feels betrayed by his mama and cuts her head off. Then Seth gouges Horus' eyes out while he's asleep and Hathor has to return them. The judges wanted the two gods to make amends since crap is getting petty. So they do, but the wily Seth decided to seduce Horus for a scheme. Some very R-rated stuff goes down between the men, but Horus is smart and collects the seed of Seth instead of having it go somewhere else. He brings the seed to his mother, Isis, who proceeds to freak out and cut off his hands. And then she collects some of Horus' seed in a bucket for revenge against her brother Seth for trying to trick Horus. How? She goes to Seth's garden, finds his favorite lettuce, and dumps the seed all over it. So here comes Seth, post lettuce lunch, declaring to the judge council he had performed the labor of a male against Horus, so he should be king. Horus is like, nah, -uh, I did it to him, and the other gods are like, okay, well, let's ask the seed then. So Seth's seed had been discarded by Isis in a marsh, and it responded from there. Well, Horus's seed, eaten on lettuce, replied from inside Seth. So Seth is pissed. He says they need to do another contest. It involves sailing stone boats down the Nile, and Horus cheats, making a wooden boat look like stone. Seth finds out, loses it, demolishes Horus's ship. Finally, enough is enough. They still have been duking it out for 80 years, and everyone is tired. The gods appeal to Osiris in the underworld as the final decision maker, and he obviously chooses his son Horus to rule, not the guy who killed him. Alrighty, up next is number three, and that is the weighing of the heart. According to the story, after death, a person's soul would be carried by the god Thoth to the Hall of Mat, where it would be judged by a panel of gods, including Anubis. Being the deity of embalming and mummification, Anubis played a significant role in the weighing of the heart ceremony. He was accountable for ensuring the deceased body was appropriately respected and readied for the afterlife, as it was he who operated the scales. My personal favorite depiction of this is seen in the TV series American Gods, which paints a visually stunning and poetic scene of Anubis weighing a heart. So the soul and the heart of the deceased would be weighed against the mat feather, which represented truth and justice. If the soul were pure and sinless, it would be permitted to enter the hereafter. But if the soul was laden with guilt, it would be devoured by a meat, a hideous beast comprised of a lion, crocodile, and hippo. This next story is a long-winded one. It's number two, the secret name of Ra. So Ra was was known by many names to the gods and humans alike, however he had one secret name which gave him his divine power. The goddess Isis sought equal power to Ra and devised a plan to obtain that secret name. Having grown old, Ra couldn't speak without spit running from his lips, and Isis one day collected the soil it fell upon. She baked it into the form of an invisible venomous serpent which she placed in the path of Ra. When the invisible serpent strikes him, burning venom runs through Ra who collapses in pain. He's brought to his bed and demands all his godly children come to him. His children run to his bed in sorrow, and unto Ra spake Isis, saying, I shall weave spells, I shall thwart thine enemy with magic. Lo, I shall overwhelm the serpent utterly in the brightness of thy glory. Thou must even now reveal thy secret name unto me, for verily thou canst be delivered from thy pain and distressed by the power of thy name. Hotter than fire burned the venom in the heart of Ra. Like raging flames, it consumed his flesh, and he suffered fierce agony. Isis waited and waited until Ra, desperate in pain seeds. It is my will that Isis be given my secret name and that it leave my heart and enter hers. When he had spoken thus, Ra vanished before the eyes of the gods. The sun boat was empty and there was a thick darkness. Isis then received in her heart the secret name of Ra and the mighty enchantress screamed out for the departure of Ra's venom and the relief of his agony. And so the god Ra was made whole once more. The venom departed from his body and there was no longer pain in the heart or any sorrow. He and Isis were now equals. And we made it to number one, which will be the heavenly cow. Arguably one of the most famous Egyptian legends, its most preserved version is found in the tomb of Seti I. Ra was getting pretty up there in age, and mankind, his own creation,
nation stirs up a rebellion against him because of it. Ra is deeply hurt. Mankind sought to kill him and assembled the pantheon of gods, asking their advice. Should he kill all of mankind as a punishment or just remove himself as they request? The gods bicker a bit, but the consensus is reached. Let thine eye go forth against those who are rebels in the kingdom, and it shall destroy them utterly. When it cometh down from heaven as Hathor, no human eye can be raised against it. Upon the advice of the council of God, Ra sends his daughter Hathor, the fiery protective sun eye, to kill the rebels. The goddess rejoiced in her work and drave over the land for so many nights that she waited in blood. Blood that begins to horrify it all. The god repents, his anger fading, and he sought to save the rest of mankind from his daughter. His messengers run to fetch barley, which is turned into beer and mixed with the already spilled blood of man. He commands the jars then be spilled at the site where the vent for Hathor rested for the night. So that when Hathor awakens, her heart is made glad. She stooped down and in her literal bloodlust began to drink eagerly, not knowing the red fluid was not blood, but beer. By the time she finished, Hathor was too drunk to pay heed to any of mankind and returned to the palace to be with family as they ask her to. Ra, however, is now far too weary to remain among men. He settles down with that family and shares the news of his earthly departure for the sky and calls upon his father Nu and the goddess of the heavens Nut to aid him. Nut takes the form of the celestial cow and ascended up, carrying Gra to become the son of all earths. Number 10, Overshadowed and the Beard. Hatshepsut for a long while was content to play the supporting role among Egypt's royals. But when she decided she wasn't anymore, things took a turn. She was the daughter of Thutmose I and wife slash sister to her half brother Thutmose II. I know, don't worry, I'll address it later in the video, stay tuned. When he died in 1479 BC and left their son as heir, she took on the role as regent to Thutmose III, but she basically just acted as the rightful ruler. As the young king came of age finally, she declared herself pharaoh. The strangest part was that she chose to portray herself in pictures as a man with a male body and a false beard. She said that the god Amun was her father and insisted that he commanded her to take charge of Egypt. Who's gonna argue with a god, right? But no one could quite explain the issue with the beard. Nevertheless, during her reign, it was a time of peace and prosperity for Egypt. Number 9, Sesostris. Sesostris was one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, who was celebrated for the extent of his conquests. He stretched the kingdom further than anyone before him, but he was not without his quirks. According to accounts by Herodotus, Sesostris left pillars on every battlefield. Along with the usual bragging and boasting of how he won, he would carve into them images of genitalia, like people do on the bathroom stalls, you know? If he thought that his enemy fought valiantly, he carved a If he thought they didn't put much of a fight, he would carve a Great. Yeah, that just goes to show what he thought about things, huh. The latter was a sign of disrespect for his subdued enemies, while the other was a sign of honor, like, hey man, you stuck it to me. Apparently, some even stood the test of time, lasting over 1500 years, and seen firsthand by Herodotus himself. For those of you who don't know, for reference, Herodotus is considered as the father of historians, one of the very first to take up the task. Number eight, ceremonial seating. The whole idea behind the pharaohs was that they were direct descendants from the gods themselves. Therefore, they too had deific powers and had the capability of restoring life to the land. The Nile River had significant importance to the people of Egypt. It provided fertile soil and water irrigation. It was pretty awesome. In order to ensure its abundance would continue, pharaohs would organize a festival where they would ceremoniously fill it with their seed. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Some historians believe that this was in honor of the creation story of how life came to be and therefore it was kind of like a fertility festival. Crowds would gather at the Nile and await the arrival of their pharaoh. They would then disrobe and give their pleasure into the river to ensure its bounty. Some historians say it was just the pharaoh who did this while others say that the men joined in after. Evidence still remains pretty slim as to whether this really did happen so take this one with a grain of salt but that's not to say that there isn't any evidence at all that it did happen. So there. Number seven, deliver me naked. Cleopatra is known as one of the most beautiful women in history, but this could be due to how she used her feminine wiles to get what she wanted. Her beauty and cunning became renowned as a result. While other queens like the one I mentioned before concealed their beauty, Cleopatra was all about showing it off, cause girl, if you got it, flaunt it. In order to help secure the political ally and power connected to Caesar, Cleopatra knew how to make an entrance and knew how to win over a guy. It's 
It's pretty easy. He was around 52 when they met and the Egyptian queen was just like 20 and in her prime so she looked great. She smuggled herself into Alexandria where Caesar was staying, had her servant tie her up in a bed sack naked and carried indoors to Caesar and she was like, have at her buddy. In other words, she wrapped her naked body in a carpet, made Caesar's jaw drop to the floor and secured one of the most beneficial unions on the spot. Honestly, not really messed up. Kind of badass, honestly. Just do your thing, work it girl. I dream of having that confidence with my clothes on. You know what I mean? Go girl, you got this, you get that empire. Number six, Cats and the Battle. Ancient Egypt would have welcomed the film the adaptation of Cats, unlike the rest of the world, with open arms and probably would have built a shrine to it. Giant human cats eating human cockroaches would be revered. Bottom line, cats in ancient Egypt were worshipped and treated like family. It was considered a crime punishable by death to harm one due to the belief in the goddess Bastet. One pharaoh even risked losing a battle because of cats themselves. The Battle of Pelusium of 525 BCE between Pharaoh Samic III and the Persian king Cambyses II resulted in the first Persian conquest of Egypt all because of cats. Cambyses took advantage of the cat loving side of Egypt and used hostages of cats and animals as leverage. So they were just kind of like, well we can't we can't fight if the cats are let loose. What are we going to do? We can't kill the cats. And that's that's uh, how they lost that battle. Number 5, honey coated. Who here hates bugs bothering them in the summer? Unless they're a bumblebee, because we love bumblebees here, right guys? But me too. No one likes the buzzing of blood suckers nipping at your skin while you're chilling out on the beach or barbecue. Well, guess what? Egyptian pharaohs hated it too, except they didn't have bug spray. So what did they do? Well, you know the phrase you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar? Well, they took that literally. Conveniently, they had servants around them at all times, so to help with the bug problem, they covered them with honey so as to distract the bees and the bugs. So as the pharaohs lounged on the sand, or wherever they were, their dutiful servants took on the job of taking on the bug bites. King Pepe, for instance, had a dedicated slave in his entourage who endured it every day. Poor guy. It was so effective that he had one designated in each room. Poor guys. Number four, assassins. This wasn't necessarily something that he did, but something that happened to him that was pretty messed up. As you can guess from the title, it involved assassins. Ramses III had a lot on his plate during his reign. There were this group of seafarers trying to destroy everyone. The tomb builders did their first labor strike over wage delays. I get you. The economy was deteriorating. Weather was devastating food production. Things were corrupt as hell. And on top of all this, his secondary wife, T.A., hated his guts. She, along with a dozen members of his harem, the head of the treasury, a military captain, a butler, the butler did it, and the chief royal chief. Chamberlain hatched an assassination plot. In 2012, researchers used a high powered CT scanner on Ramsey's mummy and saw a massive throat gash covered by an amulet said to have healing powers. The researchers summarized that an assassin cut through Ramsey's esophagus and trachea, killing him practically instantly because he probably would have just let out that fast. Some other research suggests that this happened before the other assassination plot unraveled, but either way, not a good way to go. Number three, till death do us part. Remember that thing I mentioned at the beginning? Well, if you were a servant to a pharaoh in ancient Egypt, you were hoping that your dude lived a long time because once they bite the dust, so did you. Now keep in mind, ancient Egyptians believed strongly in the afterlife. So when you died, you didn't just disappear, you literally just traveled to another world. That's the whole idea behind religion anyway. The discovery team organized by NYU, Yale, and the University of Pennsylvania discovered macabre evidence of this tradition. While excavating the mortuary ritual site of Pharaoh Aha, they found six graves not far from his tomb. They were skeletons of court officials, servants, artisans who appear to have been sacrificed to serve the Pharaoh in the afterlife. Aha's successor, Dajir, had more than 200, which are also presumed to be sacrificial burials as well. Number two, Mary Marrying your siblings. Again, remember the thing I mentioned before and now I'm actually getting to it? Promised, I promised, and here we are. Not so long ago, it was normal to court your very own cousin, but today that would be considered a very large taboo. I'm not gonna lie, it gives me the skippies, okay? I don't like imagining ma even marrying any of my cousins. That's weird to me. But the ancient Egyptians took things even farther, or should I say brought it closer, by marrying their very own siblings. 
that's one way to guarantee that the line will stay in the family. But knowing what we know about the genetic pool being too close and the complications that can arise, there's things that can go wrong. But nevertheless, it happened. DNA testing from King Tut's corpse revealed that he was a product of a union between two siblings. Pharaohs believed that they were descended from the gods. Therefore, keeping it in the family was crucial in maintaining that bloodline. King Tut even married his own half sister, same dad, when he was just 10 years old. However, generations of inbreeding resulted in a bone disease that got more severe each time. Cleopatra also married her own brother as well. That was a that was a whole thing, and then she met Caesar and that whole thing we talked about. Yeah, that thing. Let's move on. Number one, Akhenaten. One of the most polarizing figures in Egyptian history, Akhenaten tried to get rid of religion and as a result they got rid of him. Akhenaten earned the title of heretic king and a recent discovery has revealed that his deeds might have been a lot darker. Akhenaten came to power in the 1350s and reigned for around 17 years. He is known for creating a new religion surrounding Aten, who was generally represented as a sun disk. Sometime around his fourth year he started sending out agents to erase names and images of certain gods from existing texts and monuments. Around the fifth year, he claimed to discover the location of the new royal city and moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Akhetaten, today known as Tel el Amarna. There, his people suffered greatly under slave labor, with bodies being uncovered younger than 20, many with bones broken, spines broken, along with evidence of severe malnutrition. When the pharaoh finally passed, his tomb remained unfinished and his name was stricken from the history books. At least now, we can see why. Kicking off the list at number 10, got a passport. Ramses II is known as one of the greatest ancient Egyptian rulers of all time. He was called Ramses the Great, so that's a good sign already. At a young age, he fought in harsh battles to protect the borders of Egypt, and during his reign, the Egyptian army reached 100,000 men. That's a pretty large army. He was later referred to as the Great Ancestor, and it didn't take long for Ramses II to declare himself a god. It's always fun being like, hey, by the way, I'm a god now. That's how cool I am. 30 years into his ruling, Ramses was ritually turned into an Egyptian god. It was a formal thing. Though it wasn't until 3,000 years later until Ramses would truly soar through the skies. He was buried in his treasure after 96 years of living, and in 1974, he finally started to show signs of aging. Not too bad. He went from being on display to being sent to Paris to get a glow up, you know, to preserve the king's body even longer. Instead of being listed as luggage on the way to Paris, the pharaoh was given an official Egyptian passport for the commute. The government gave a mummy a passport. This is like the first five minutes of a horror film. Under occupation, it even said king. And there was even a small disclaimer noting that he was in fact still dead. You can never be too sure, you know? Number nine. Baboon tattoos. Ancient Egyptians worshipped animals. This is common knowledge now at this point. We've heard about their love towards cats, which I'll explain later on, but what about baboons? Yeah, they were pretty important pieces to this ancient puzzle as well. Some mummies were found with tattoos of baboons on their bodies. Now, one of the most strange things that pharaohs did back in ancient Egyptian days was train baboons to make arrests. Imagine stealing a pair for your family and then four baboons start doing parkour chasing you down. That's so alarming. I would just throw in and be like, please stop. You're so scary and strong. They train baboons to pick fruit, they train them to make beer, and they also train them to entertain. Yeah, these baboons were the life of the party. Their dance moves alone would be reason enough to tattoo one on my arm. So you know what? I get it. Get a Harambe tattoo. I'm like, you know, I, it's, I, I see it. I see the similarities. Number eight, worship dung beetles. So worshiping a baboon that dances and makes holiday ales, yeah, I can see how one would worship such a creature. That makes sense. But pharaohs also worship dung beetles and their reasoning may surprise you. Dung beetles, also known as scarabs, are the only species in the entire world that follows the Milky Way naturally. Animals are born with natural instincts. Sea turtles race to the sea. These guys follow the cosmos. It's pretty wild. It's one thing to follow the sun naturally because it gives off warmth. Sunflowers will literally turn their head to find the sun, which is super creepy, but it's beautiful. These insects would follow the line of the Milky Way and then roll their poop towards it. They'd be like, hello Milky Way, and they just... Hieroglyphs of these beetles are seen all over. Like near the sacred lake at the Temple of Karnak, for example, there's a massive scarab monument. And today, if you walk around it nine times, you get good luck. And don't worry, you don't have to roll any droppings at the same time. Don't get dizzy, that's all, it's the only rule. The scarab is there to represent the god Kefri, which ancient Egyptians believed was the sun. I grew up thinking the sun was a baby, but that's because I watched Teletubbies, so, you know, depends. Number seven, surprise each other. 
Cleopatra and Julius Caesar were a pretty beneficial couple, to say the least. Cleopatra would use Caesar's armies, which in turn would allow her to rule Egypt, while Caesar was eyeing down Cleopatra's extreme wealth. They were the perfect pair. She was able to financially support Caesar enough for him to return to power back in Rome, but how did such a perfect pair meet in the first place? Did Cleopatra swipe right? Hmm, no. Well, a then 52-year-old Julius Caesar visited the much younger Cleopatra, so she then sent a surprise gift to his chambers. She got her crew to roll her up in a carpet or bed sheets, it's not really confirmed, something along those lines, and then delivered her to his door, completely nude. He unraveled a naked Cleopatra, and he's like, okay, hello. That's pretty impressive. Cleopatra was down for fun surprises. While we don't recommend this as an approach ever, it's one worth mentioning on our list. Number six, gender reveal parties. We've all seen those videos. A guy goes to hit a baseball, he misses it. The baseball breaks and there's pink dust all around his feet and he starts crying, it's wonderful. Gender reveal parties were quite popular, you know, until they started lighting wildfires. But back in the day, Egyptians had a pretty interesting method for predicting the gender of a newborn. Instead of peeing on a pregnancy test, you would have to use wheat and barley seeds instead. Depending on how those barley crops grew, they could accurately predict the sex of the child. They were right 85% of the time, which is quite impressive back in the day. We went from watering crops to burning them. Hashtag, it's a boy. Number five, space knife. Only a few years after King Tut's tomb was discovered in the Valley of the Kings, archeologist Howard Carter found two daggers that were buried with the king. Now, like I mentioned earlier, it's not uncommon to be buried with your treasure or belongings. It's why ancient Egyptians would build these tombs in a certain way, so grave robbers can't just sneak in after you pass away and then take all of your goodies. So two daggers were found with King Tut, one made of iron and the other with gold. Now, with iron being more rare than gold during the Bronze Age, this was quite a big deal. With recent advancements in technology, we're able to use a technique called portable X-ray fluorescent spectrometry, and according to the journal Meteorites in Planetary Science, the blade is actually made of iron, nickel, and cobalt, suggesting that its material is that of extraterrestrial origin. A blade fell from the sky, and now a king has it. That's pretty insane. Also, aliens? Just saying. Number four, KB-55. Also located in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, Tomb 55, otherwise known as KB-55, was found by Edward Arton back in 1907. It was discovered right next to King Tut's tomb, and the reason that we call this tomb by a number rather than a name is because we really don't know for sure who's inside. Even the walls of the tombs inside, they aren't covered with beautiful hieroglyphs to tip us off on their history or their ruling, it's just bare. The only hint as to who is buried remains on the walls. It's one hieroglyph that remains, and it was discovered also in 1907, and it translates simply to, the evil one shall not live again. That's very scary. That's Definitely scarier than Greg was here. I don't know. Even massive stones were built and set up in order to prevent anything from getting out, whereas usually with ancient tombs, it's the opposite, so that's pretty scary. The description for those inside the tomb has also been destroyed, so we have really no idea who's in KB55, or what. <laughs> Number three, ancient Photoshop. When we look back at ancient artwork, we see these kings and queens and they look athletic. They look to be in great shape, when in reality, these pharaohs were probably quite obese. I mean, think about it. If you slam wine and bread all day and you have baboons dancing around, plus a little dab of honey every, I don't know, eight minutes, yeah, you're gonna gain some weight. Many of these ancient pharaohs had diabetes. And Queen Hatshepsut, who was alive during the 15th century BC, her sarcophagus shows her as slim and strong, but historians all agree that she was out of shape and extremely unhealthy. Honestly, I would do the exact same if I was there back then. She was ahead of her time. If somebody made a statue for me, I'd be like, yeah, give it an eight pack, make him extremely jacked in 7-2. Can we do that? Sure, no one's gonna ask questions. I'm Dwayne The Rock Johnston, just write it down, please. Number two, worship cats. I am allergic to cats, but I still love them. I still pet them. I ruined my entire night just to get my face right there next to their cute little furry face. But ancient Egyptians, like I said earlier, really loved cats. They respected them, they worshiped them. Even though at the time dogs were respected for being hunters, cats were still considered magical creatures. So if there's ever a cat versus dog argument going on on your end of the screen, cats win. I'm allergic and I'm still saying cats win. That's, that's huge. If you had a cat, it means you had good luck. When cats passed away, they too were mummified back in the day. You would think that alone was plenty of respect, but ancient Egyptians and pharaohs went a step further. After their cat died, they would shave their eyebrows off and then mourn until they grew back. 
That's like three and a half months of cat depression. That's wild. Next time your friend tells you that their cat passed away, tell them that if they really love them, they'll shave their eyebrows off and then see what they say. Also, you don't have to make your friends shave their eyebrows. Let's leave this one in the past. That's fun. Just be sad with eyebrows. Be like, hmm. Number one, fight a hippo. Egypt's first pharaoh, Menes, although we know next to nothing about his history, there is something there that has historians scratching their heads to this day. At his early time, the pharaoh was setting out to unite all of Egypt under his rule. The time that he ruled as well is considered a rather peaceful time when comparing it to years later. We know that he was well respected, and we also know that after his 63 years of peaceful ruling, he was stomped to death by a hippo. That's horrible, it's a horrible way to go out. He was an elderly ruler at that time. He was surrounded by guards and somehow a hippo got all the way to his chambers. A hippo, and then ended the pharaoh's life. Some suggest that the reason there's nothing written about this pharaoh's tragic, horrible demise is because it's possible that the hippo was his pet. This is why you don't try and tame a beast as a pet. Perhaps this was an early similar situation as the Siegfried and Roy tiger attack. Just stick to smaller magical cats. They're much safer, they won't stop you to death. Oh my god, it's horrible. Guys, those were just 10 of the many mysterious things ancient Egyptian pharaohs did, from worshipping Milky Way dung beetles to showing up naked at somebody's front door. Those times were pretty wild.